the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Thank you, Jesus, for the gift of quiet. Thank you for the opportunity to gather once again and to hopefully listen and learn. And Mother Mary, we ask that you wrap us in your mantle and lead us closer to the heart of your Son as we pray together. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners now and at the hour of our death. It's an old youth ministry trick. Quiet them down by the side of the cross. Not to use prayer as a crowd control method, but it does work. It does help. So thank you to the fathers that have joined us. Um, I'm going to speak directly to them for just a brief moment, and then of course all of us will benefit, I hope. Um, so I, we have a crisis of fatherhood in our culture right now. That's, I'm not going to make any bones about it. There's a crisis of fatherhood that I think has trickled into all areas of our culture and all areas of our society at this particular moment. And I even think there might be a little bit of a crisis of fatherhood in our church and that we as lay people have sometimes treated priests as sacrament dispensers. And sometimes you as priests have treated people as butts and pews and not children to love. I'm not saying you, I'm just speaking in general. Maybe you, I don't know you. I know like two of you. Um, and the best thing about fathers is that you can do the same thing as you do with sisters and just call them father and get away with it. But then there's also, I think, a challenge in fatherhood in the, in the priesthood right now. And I, I've seen this in priests that I've become close to and in conversations that I've had with, with... One of the weird parts of my job is that oftentimes I find myself at events and as the speaker who's there alone as the speaker and then there's like the priest that's there as the priest, I get to end up talking to the priest. And this past summer, Jesus on multiple occasions gave me just like 30 to 45 minutes with priests that I'll probably never see again and I just got to pick their brains and they got to pick my brain and we just got to talk for a little while. I think a lot of priests are very lonely. You're busy. And you're surrounded by people a lot. You've got a lot of things to do. But at the end of the day, you go back to a rectory, even if you have another priest living there. You go back to a home, and there's no one there to necessarily lean on, or talk to, or vent to, ask questions of. And so, one of my goals in the past year has been to let the priests in my life know that we, especially my family, we love them, and we want to be close to them. We want to welcome them into our lives the same way that we hope they welcome us into theirs. Because that's the only way that a father can actually be a father is if he is with his children. You're never a father in isolation. And so if you're in a parish where you do feel isolated, or if you are with people who you don't think love you as a father, or if maybe you've struggled to love them as a father, I just want you to know that many of us in the church see that, and we love you. And if you need us, we are here for you the same way that we desperately need you in, in our lives of faith. So I just wanted to say that up at the top. Um, I, I told a story about Father Mike Schmitz earlier and my little girl giving him her beloved Charlie the Chicken. Um, and I was just on a Skype call with Father Mike a couple weeks ago and I just asked him how he was doing, how's life, the school year's beginning, things are kind of chaotic, he's got you know, videos coming out, he's got a book coming out, um, how things were going with his students and he, his face lit up and he was like, I just, I love my students so much. I was like, that's so great. Tell me about him. Like, tell me about, and he just kind of started talking. I've never met these college students in my life. I'll probably never will. And he was just talking about his kids, like talking about these young people that he gets to walk with and accompany and, and spend time with and minister to in a very unique and pointed way. Even though he is a very public man that a lot of people know through a screen, his job is day to day working with these, these college students face to face, bit by bit. And he said, spiritual fatherhood is just such a gift. And he meant it. From, from his bones, I could tell. Like, spiritual fatherhood is such a gift. And so I, I do want to tackle a little bit of that today with you, as well as with everyone, go through these statistics and these disaffiliation numbers and the document of Christus Vivit that I do think directly addresses a lot of this. We're going to start big. We're going to start in the weeds of the statistics facing the disaffiliation crisis. And I'm going to call it a crisis because we've gotten more people leaving than we've got coming in. And we've got more people leaving for very unique reasons. It's not always the scandal. And it's not always, I don't believe in God. And it's not always, um, my parents made me and so now I don't want to anymore. Most people don't just leave the church, right? Most people leave the church because of something. Because of someone. Or for lack of knowing someone. 
And I think when we look at Gen Z, when we look at millennials, and those are the two groups that we're going to talk about today, Gen Z being um, the current high school, middle school, even some college, millennials being late college, young adulthood, into their 30s, and, and some young 40s. When we look at those numbers of disaffiliation, I think we're gonna start to see a, a common theme, a very specific through line of how to address that, and the way to fight the crisis, I think first is to not necessarily say we're gonna win the battle right away, but that we're going to be present to the people in the midst of this battle and love them through the work that they are doing and trying to understand how they fit in the life of the church. I know that was kind of a crazy little word salad, but my brain is, is going as I'm talking. I will also say at the time, I'm always very intimidated when I speak in front of priests, Again, my sister's a canon lawyer, so I'm always imminently concerned that I'm going to say something heretical and she's going to correct me. So maybe that's just a complex that I have. Um, so if you want to loosen those collars, fathers, feel free. Like, I'm fine with that too. So who are we working with? Who, who are we engaging with? Who's in your pews? Who is in your youth ministry program? Who's in your high school? Who's walking past and they want nothing to do with what's happening in that building? Who looks at you and, and kind of like thinks you might be wearing a costume on Halloween? I know that's priest's least favorite day of the year because everybody just assumes you're dressed up like other people would be. I was flying from Pittsburgh to Dallas yesterday and Bishop Burns from the Diocese of Dallas was in the seat in front of me. And he sat down, I was already sitting, and we know each other. Um, I had dinner with him after I addressed the USCCB last June. So I knew he knew me and I knew him. We just kind of like nodded at one another, like just smiled and nodded and he sat down and I was in my seat, like acted like we didn't know each other, but because I didn't want to, I didn't want to out him. I didn't want to be like, hello, Bishop of the Roman Catholic Church. It is good to see you on this plane. Because like he was just kind of like traveling incognito. Like he was, you know, he had a University of Dallas polo on, um, not a hat and a pectoral cross, the whole nine yards. We talked to each other as we got off the plane. We weren't like rude to one another. Um, Anyway, I just thought I would throw that out there. Who are we walking with? <laughs> Who's in our peace? <laughs> Who's there? Who are we talking to day by day? And here's, this is my biggest pet peeve, is that we, so many people of a certain generation assume that like everybody younger than them is just a millennial. And that is not the case anymore. And then even Gen Z has like a, a timestamp now. Like my daughter is not iGen slash Gen Z. Like she's generation alpha is what they're calling her generation. We just started with the alphabet right back over. Um, but her, every generation I think from here on out is gonna have like a cool little moniker or name because the technology is changing so much and because the things that we consume. So I do always like to show this at the outset. Um, just kind of the, the, the spectrum of generation these days. And we're going to mainly concentrate on Gen Y. We gave ourselves a fun name because we're special, millennials. And then Gen Z or iGen, as some people call them, because they've never not known the iPhone. That's kind of why I think they've been dubbed iGen. I kind of disagree a little bit with these graphics, uh, the graphic numbers there. I think millennials can kind of be brought up to like 97, 98, and, and Gen Z from like 98 on up to about 2014, 2015 is what most sociologists are saying these days. The other big thing is that a generation isn't just an age gap, it's often defined by the technology they use and the things they remember. So if you have a conversation with um, Gen Xers, the forgotten generation, Gen Xers remember the Berlin Wall. I was, like, I have, that's a historical event in my mind. Like, that was a long, long time ago. I don't remember much of, like, the Clinton impeachment because I was very much a child, but, but the generation right before me does, right? Because they were in high school. They were growing up through all of that. The big thing for millennials is 9-11. We remember 9-11, remember where we were, what we were doing, what we did on that day. And if you were to scroll through Instagram earlier this month, it was mostly millennials reflecting and commenting on that. Because we were children who've grown up in a world that, that is just defined by what happened after that. Like, I don't remember airports before TSA, and my dad does, which is why his water bottle always gets taken from him and mine is always empty. Because I've never not known I can't bring water on a plane. <laughs> And he's still, almost 20 years later, confused by that reality. So, so millennials very much hold on to 9-11. The other thing about what 9-11 did to my generation is for a lot of us, it was the first time that we realized people didn't like our country. We just, we, it never occurred to me that American exceptionalism was not just automatically accepted around the world. And if you think, well, what does that have to do with the church? It has a lot to do with the church because I believe it began the mistrust that millennials have towards institutions and the mistrust that millennials have towards the other that might be bigger. Um, for Gen Z, 
there's two things that sociologists point to as the defining factor depending on where they fall and the, where they were born. Because some Gen Zers were very much alive during 9-11 but were infants and, and toddlers. Um, they remember, sociologists say, the housing crisis of 2008. And you might think, kids don't think about the housing crisis, but they do when their parents are sitting at the kitchen table deciding, are we selling our car? Do I have to get a second job? No, sorry, you can't go to that school thing because I can't pay for it. So the housing crisis of 08 and what that did socioeconomically. The other thing they're saying that the younger Gen Zers remember distinctly is the election of 2016 and just the rhetoric that very much existed in our culture and we're going to start seeing it more and more now. The 24-hour news cycle started 9-11 and has not shut down since this is just how we are and how we exist. The way information is propagated amongst the two generations is also distinct. Millennials, if you walk up to a a college football game or a high school football game. High school is probably a better example of this. If you walk in a high school football stadium and there's a game going on, you're going to see everybody using their phone because we're all on our devices all the time. A baby boomer and a Gen Xer is going to pull their phone out, they're going to look at it, and then they're going to put it away. Right? We're going to look at our phone, we're going to put it away. Or we're going to stay on it, but it's going to be a singular experience. I look at my phone. Millennials, especially younger millennials and then Gen Zers, we look at our phone, and you're also going to see, hey, did you see this? And there's the turn. Social use of device instead of singular isolating use of the device. It's also why if you have conversations with Gen Zers, and we're going to look at these in a second, the apps that they choose to use are much more universalizing apps than just isolating apps. All these things factor into how we approach them as church, I promise. I just I want to lay in this big framework because most of the time, to get into the weeds of the data by yourself, I often become very depressed very quickly about the state of our culture. And then B, my head starts to swirl with numbers and I start to feel like, well, I could never fix this, so why is it even worth knowing this? But I think when we learn some of these statistics together and we paint the landscape together and we know who's sitting in our churches and we know who's not coming to our churches and we know what they're dealing with behind the scenes and internally and mentally, we can start to formulate some, some fixes to the problems. And remember from this morning, the fix to the problem isn't always the program. A lot of time it's presence. So we'll keep going. Barna, and write this down, everybody needs to go by, the Barna Gen Z study, you can just get it on their website, it's 160 pages of just straight data about iGen. And it's fascinating because it paints a landscape of these young people that are growing up in and out of our church. But when they did kind of a snapshot of identity, and religious identity, we're seeing an increase in the nuns. Bishop Barron talks about this a lot, the N-O-N-E-S's, the disaffiliated slash the never affiliated, the no attachment to, relationship with, or even desire for church. And so I know that looks kind of confusing, but if we just concentrate on the Gen Z, we're looking at, at 14% of nuns and 13% atheists of this sample size that they did, which is pretty good snapshot of the United States of America. So, yeah, sure, we've got 42% who are affiliating as Christian and 17% affiliating as Catholic, but those numbers are not as comforting as are the numbers of atheists and non-believers are worrisome, I think. And we're obviously seeing a change. We're seeing that there are more and more people who are not affiliating. But look, look at the millennials. There's 15% of the millennials who are nothing. That's just 1% difference. But, but we're seeing the young, if we're going to go by Vatican and USCCB define, definings, the definitions of the ages of young, we're seeing more and more that I have no religious affiliation. I'm not attached to church. Culturally, personally, or the I was raised Catholic. I was Catholic. I used to be Catholic. I was raised Christian. It's something my parents told me to do. I was part of. I was forced to do. I'll keep going. I love this statistic. And I know it kind of looks like a weird graph, but I'm going to pull the information out of it for a second. The primary mark of adulthood. When you were growing up, in your head, what do you think made an adult? For me as a little kid, I distinctly remember having a crisis in like seventh grade when I realized one day I would have to buy a washer and a dryer. I don't know why that's what it was. Maybe because my mom went to go buy a new washing machine and for the first time I ever like looked at prices of an appliance and realized like, that's a lot of money. Like am I ever going to have $450 to go like purchase something that washes my clothes or am I going to have to use a laundromat? And the thought of using a laundromat was terrifying to me because I'd never been in one. Like that was in my head, buying appliances marked adulthood. 
So look at this for a second. I, maybe I'm a weird millennial. Maybe I fit more in the Gen Z category because here's what the data shows us. 49% of millennials, millennials say that emotional stability is the mark of adulthood. When I'm emotionally stable, I don't know what that means. I don't know what emotional stability, does it mean I'm not going to my therapist anymore? Does it mean I found a therapist? Because millennials are the therapy generation who tell everybody what the therapist told us. I Instagram story the fact that I had a live meeting with my therapist last week and proudly advertise the fact that there's anxiety pills in my bag right now for when I need them. Like millennials are all about people knowing I got it together. What are Gen Zers all about? Think back to that housing crisis of 08. Financial stability. I want to know that I have what I have and I, I have what I, can, I need. If I need something, I can go get it. We're seeing more and more Gen Zers not go to college, instead take gap years, instead go to vocational training, instead just get jobs straight away because they don't want to be stuck with what we millennials have been saddled with forever, which is college debt, which is preventing us from buying houses, from getting married. Some people are using it as the excuse for why they're not having kids. I told somebody the other day that I have a 50, um, not a 504, I don't even know what it's called, a Roth. I have a Roth IRA. See, I don't even know what it's called, but I know that I send money into it every year. And they looked at me and they're like, you have extra cash? Like, you have extra money to play with? I'm like, well, I'm not playing with it, I'm investing it. And it was a foreign concept to a very dear friend of mine that A, somebody working for the church would have money to invest, which told me more about how little the church pays than my, my generation, but then B, that's not a reality for a lot of my my generation. Tommy and I have totally broken the norms in that we got married under 30, we had a kid under 30, we bought two houses under 30, and we have retirement plans that will be growing to where we can retire by 65. Like, that's not the norm for my generation. My mom is a CPA and financial planner, so maybe that's part of it. But we're not, that's not a generational norm anymore. Now, if we look at what's important for Gen Z and millennials, I know that's kind of a small, this is why you need to go buy the study. But I'll just look at them. So for Gen Zers, 66% want to accomplish before they're 30, they want to finish their education. Millennials, before 30, we want to become financially independent. So some of these, some of the lines are kind of blurred in some senses. Keep going down. So Gen Z, 66%, I want to start a career. I want to become financially independent. I want to follow my dreams. Look at this. Where's God in any of this? Where's faith? Here. So 29% of millennials want to become more mature spiritually before they're 30, and only 16% of Gen Z want to become more spiritually mature before they're 30. So it's not even, I've disaffiliated, I've left. It's, I'm just not interested. It's just, I'm not, it's not a priority. What does spiritual maturity have to do with my day-to-day -day existence and life? Am I... Investing in the right things, am I spending my time in the right ways, is this long term going to affect me in any way, shape, or form? This is why some people argue that painting the concept of eternity and memento mori and hey, you're going to die and you're going to need us when you do die, which I don't think we should scare young people into faith. I'm not necessarily on, on board with that. But thinking bigger picture rather than be captured by the moment. And part of why I think this generation of, of, of teenagers is captured by the moment is because everything is constantly updating all the time. Right? The feed of our Twitter and of our Instagram and of our Facebook, there's never a moment of it's, it's not constantly being updated. And if there's something new that's always going to be provided for me right away, why do I have to think about what's coming in five years or 10 years or 50 years or when I die? Because there's something attracting my attention and holding my gaze right this second. And that's very, to use some scriptural language, pleasing to the eyes. Right? It's, it's, it's engaging to look at. I didn't fall asleep until midnight last night. I was exhausted. You know why I didn't fall asleep until midnight? Because I was scrolling through BuzzFeed, looking for articles about the final season of Veep on HBO because I finally finished it on the airplane. I was exhausted. I was tired. I needed to close my eyes, but I wanted to look at something that could hold my gaze and capture my attention in that moment, even though I know it wasn't good for me. Because very much... Addiction is a reality when it comes to those. And, and I like to think I'm an emotionally mature, financially stable adult, and yet I still fall into that trap. If we just look at the top social media sites that are used daily by the two generations, you, you notice a, a trend. So millennials, we're still on Facebook. We're keeping our moms and our grandmothers happy on there by posting pictures of our kids when we have them. <laughs> we're on Instagram, we're on Twitter. Gen Z, what's the app that they seem to use the most? And this I always find fascinating because I don't think of YouTube as a place that I would go to hang out. They're on YouTube. 
They're watching and they're creating. More teens, are, they have their own channels. They're not attached to cable. They're not attached to network shows. They're not attached to, they, they, they go on Netflix to watch the classics, like The Office and Friends, which are considered classics now, which just trouble me greatly. <laughs> but but they, they are no longer bound by media that is created for them, but they are now part of the creative process. I think one of the reasons YouTube is so fascinating to Gen Zers is because of the comment stream on the bottom. This is why Twitch has become incredibly popular. Watching other people play video games still blows my mind. It just, it does. But my friend Jonathan Blevins, and this is, this is a name drop that some of you might even care about. So Jonathan Blevins' brother is Ninja, the guy that plays Fortnite. Jonathan Blevins is a director of evangelization in Chicago. So Ninja's Catholic, I don't know if you guys knew that. But Jonathan streams on Twitch every week, like three and four times on Twitch. And he is playing a video game. And people are watching, like thousands of people tune into this guy's Twitch channel, and he talks about Jesus as he's playing Fortnite. And not in the way that you think, like he's not opening up the gospel and preaching. Like he's just talking about, you know, the love of Christ, talking about companionship and community and friendship, talking about how like even within Fortnite you're creating these groups to go, what are they called, subs? I've never played the game and I'd be terrible at it, but like creating almost like artificial community online because that's what we seek to do and that's the only way to win within life is to have people surrounding you. He's using a modern method of communication where young people are and he always ends his Twitch streams by saying, I love you, God loves you more, go do something great in the world. And the people that he has engaged in dialogue with about faith the people that have reached out to him after the fact to send an email asking about Catholicism, to, to get a book recommendation, to find out where can I go to Mass. The people that have shown up to his parish looking to meet him in person and stick around for some sort of community experience in the church parish. Because that's where they are. They're not watching NBC. They could care less about Netflix shows. They want to be where their generation is. If we look at the devices that they're using, and this I always find really interesting. So desktop isn't even on the Gen Z list <laughs> at all, right? They're on their phones for 15 hours a week. And I think that number's low. It's like per day. I would say it's, it's closer to 10 to 12 per day, especially if they're in a school with a one-to-one -one tablet or computer experience, which I think is the worst thing that's ever happened to education. But that's a whole other discussion when we have wine in my system and I can really tell you what I think. But like we've, we put screens in front of them to learn. They have screens to be entertained. That It takes away their ability to have actual face-to-face -face conversation and dialogue. They already own laptops. Tommy and I had the debate the other day of at what age will we give our two-year-old a phone? Because the conversation's already starting among preschool parents that your kid has to have a phone by third and fourth grade so that they can contact you in case something happens at school. Which in the back of my head, I don't want my kid to have access to the internet, but I do want my kid to be able to text me if a shooter comes in the building. So which one do I, which one do, I do? Right? My, my good friend, uh, Nicole, she has four kids. Her oldest, Sophia, has been homeschooled up to fifth grade. She's now in a private school in our diocese. And she came home on the first day of school, and she was just so excited that she's in a school environment, and she's finally like hit that point where she was ready for this school environment and couldn't wait for homework. Like, she was excited about homework. And she, was, she had such a great day, but then she told her mom, and Nicole's telling me this secondhand, she's like, Sophia she seemed just like a little bummed about something, and so she was kind of picking away at it. Sophia's a Gen Zer, and she's like, so, so something seems wrong, like what's off, what's wrong? And she's like, well, all my friends are just saying like, they would just, they would, they would continue their conversations at school in the group chat, and I, I don't have a phone, I'm not in the group chat. And so all of a sudden now, Nicole, a mom in her 30s, whose kid wants to be included and wants to be able to make friends and wants to engage with others her own age and even just talk about the homework, has been isolated because she doesn't have the screen that keeps you connected. Because conversations don't end now. I don't tell my husband goodbye when we finish texting, like, because we're just going to pick it up later on. Like, what, once we started talking, May 7th, 2014, we haven't stopped since because we've never had to. Because we've always had this. So that's where they're attached. Does that mean that our course correction needs to be we put all Catholic things on the phone because that's where they are and we try to baptize the device? Maybe. Or does it mean we try to draw them away from it? Some people would say we just destroy all of it, and I think that's stupid, and we shouldn't. I think there's balance. Virtue is found in the means. How do we do that? Keep going. Weekly TV usage. This one just fascinates me because I'm a TV buff. But they're not watching television. They're just not. 
Most of those Gen Zers, if, especially if, if uh, my daughter's generation, she will, Rose has never had cable. She's never had a cable outlet in our house. We use Hulu Live, Netflix, YouTube TV, and we steal my parents' direct TV feed when we want to watch football. Like that's how <laughs> we watch TV together. Right, so even just the consumption of media, which is important. How are millennials and Gen Zers getting their news? Are we watching talking heads on a screen? Or are we reading scrolls on a Twitter feed? And hashtags that give us the information that then formulate our opinions. I had no idea, I was at a retreat for Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday up in Pittsburgh planning these conferences. And I, I hopped back on Twitter and I'd like tweeted a little bit or like been scrolling through, but I had no idea what was going on with, I don't even, I still don't even really know what's going on with all the stuff with the president right now. But instead of going to find an article, or instead of like rushing to the CNN website to read like a, a bullet point summary, or even texting my dad, who's a Fox News aficionado, who could tell me his opinions on things, I searched up some podcasts, and I clicked a couple hashtags, and then I felt informed. That's how I gathered my information. I don't want to hear Tom Brokaw. I want to read five different reporters and somebody who was maybe in the, in the hall where they were interviewing the whistleblower guy or whatever. That's how we're gathering information. Again, the most used devices, sorry. So let's, let's then, if we know this about the way they're consuming media, let's take a step back and look at the millennial Catholics, my generation, and our experience of faith and our disaffiliation from the faith. Only 14% of millennial Catholics are going to church on Sunday. 14%. Abysmal. Sad number. Mass is not our priority. Sunday Mass is not our priority. We go to the Church of Brunch, where we can get bottomless mimosas and nice bacon frittatas, right? Like, that's, that's what we want to engage. Why? Everybody always wants to roll their eyes about brunch. Everybody always wants to say, well, Mass is more important. Yeah, but at brunch, I can have community. And at brunch, I can talk to people about my crappy week. And at brunch, I am heard. And there's a perception among a lot of millennial Catholics that mass is passive. That's not to say that we hand over the homily to a layperson, by any means. It's to say what would it look like if within our parish communities there was community engagement before and after the celebration that is most important to our faith. Because that's what millennials are longing for, intentional community. Two and three millennials are going to leave by 2020, so five months from now. We're going to have even more that have drifted away. These statistics are from 2016. I almost wonder if some of them are now skewed because of what's been happening the past couple of years. Um, but I, I still think they, they hold some weight. 70% of unaffiliated millennials think that the church is too concerned with money and with power. We don't have to go into why. 47% of affiliated believe that too. I don't know if you watched Twitter when Notre Dame was burning. But if you clicked on that hashtag, five minutes through it, and you were really sad about the way the church was seen in the world. Because the argument was, why can't they just sell St. Peter's? And in the back of my head, I'm like, to who? Who would buy it? Like, who's buying that? That's, and then also this understanding of the, the riches or the beauty or the glory of the things that we have are something that we hold on to because we want to look powerful and wealthy as opposed to a place of worship. Because there's a misunderstanding of the concept of worship and beauty within worship. So it's, it's multi-layered. But the fact that 47% who consider themselves Catholic sit there and think this church's priorities are out of whack leads me to believe maybe we need to fix our messaging a little bit or change the way we're having conversations about who we are as church. I think Francis has been trying to push us to this. A church that is poor. A church that cares about the people on the margins. A church that doesn't have the pomp and circumstance so much as the people and the love that is worthy of pomp and circumstance, but it's the people. We can keep going. 27% are expected to stay, so it's just a flip of the two and three going to leave. This one always blows my mind, though. So 14% of us go to Mass on Sunday, but 58% of millennials give up meat on Friday during Lent. So I don't go to church. I'm not going to Mass. I don't receive the Eucharist, but I'm going to eat the fish fillet instead of the chick fillet. And, and I don't know that it's Mark McDonald's marketing that convinced me of that. I think it's an attachment to the spiritual and a desire to participate in traditions that are just embedded within me that I might not even understand. I might not know why I'm eating fish on Friday, but it's a thing that we do as Catholics. And yeah, I'm Catholic. I was raised Catholic. I, yeah, I was part of that once. I also think, too, there is an attachment of millennials to traditions that 
on the one hand could sometimes lead to a rigidity that is unhealthy, but on the other hand could be an access point to inviting to go deeper. I think there's an interesting phenomenon of television shows that look at the hyper-spiritual, that Lucifer show, there's a new show coming out about exorcisms, like a, a guy who's studying, I think it's on Fox or CBS. Um, there's this fascination with otherworldly things that we are seeing play out in media. And so eating meat versus eating fish is almost this like otherworldly thing that I'm participating in that I might not fully understand. I think it gives us an access point to millennials during Lent that we haven't always taken advantage of. What would it look like if Ash Wednesday, where a lot of people show up, even though it's not a Holy Day of Obligation, but it's because we get something, like we, we get, there's a, a takeaway, there's a, a goodie bag on our foreheads, and we can tell everybody, I'm Catholic, for this one day I'm Catholic, and it's this thing that I did on this one day. How are we attracting those people to come home? How are we welcoming them back to a place that maybe they haven't been in a really long time? How are we letting them know that we're just happy they showed up? And if they come back the Sunday, great. And if they don't, we're still here for you. 67% of unaffiliated millennials believe that the church is too focused on rules. So that's the, we told you not to have sex before you're married, but we never told you why. We never told you what this was about. We just told you no. We explained the Ten Commandments, but we did not get you to fullness of life in the Beatitudes. Because 47% of affiliate millennials also think the same thing. It's a marketing problem. It's a catechesis problem. It's a relationship problem. It's if someone told me something to do, but never walked with me as I was trying to do it. Or mom and dad just said, because I said so, and never engaged with my questions or offered me something to read or invited me to go have a conversation with someone else. And so the top down, shove down your throat, this is what you have to do model has led to a generation who looks at the church from the outside in and goes, mm, I'm not going to be part of that. Those are power-hungry, money-grubbing folks who tell me what to do and they don't actually love me. And they don't care about me and they don't want anything to do with me. I'll just go get the bottomless mimosas with my friends who will always be there. Nearly half of Christian millennials think that sharing one's faith is wrong. And that's a PC culture thing. That's I don't want to offend you. I don't want to upset you. I don't want to overset my bounds. I don't want you to think I'm one of those weird Jesus freaks. Nearly really half don't want to share it. But, and this one always bugs me a little bit, 94% of those same Christian millennials think that knowing Jesus is the best thing that could happen to anyone. So I love him, and I want to have a relationship with him, and I want you to have a relationship with him too, but I'm not going to be the one that gets you there. Because I don't want to step on your toes. I don't want to be that Christian guy, that Christian girl in my secular job. I don't want to be the person who's only ever about the church stuff. Or sometimes you even see this among the people who like are the churchy people. Right? Like they do the churchy stuff and they do the young adult or youth ministry thing because that's just all that they've ever done. But then you actually try to have a conversation with them about their relationship with Jesus. Or you ask them, what's your favorite way to pray? Or you know, when's the last time you like really felt like you heard the voice of God present in your life? They, they're stone-faced. They don't have the language to articulate it. If you talk to Gen Zers, Robert Fiducia is a very good friend of mine in, in ministry, and he did a survey of the young people in his parish in Nashville, a fairly large parish in Nashville, about their favorite ways to pray. That was the question. What's your favorite way to pray? Like over half of the participants said the Our Father. And so when he pressed them on it, okay, what about the Our Father do you love? Like what's your favorite petition within the Our Father? Or what, what about that prayer brings you comfort and peace? The stone-faced. No answers. Because it's the prayer that they were taught. It's not a prayer that they're actually... Maybe. I don't want to discount their prayer. And God hears all the prayers. Even the most mundane or bored prayer is a prayer worth praying. But they don't have the language on how to talk to God. And then if you ask them, well, how would you have a conversation with a friend? How would you start that conversation with a friend? You know how they're communicating? Snapchat. Which is pictures, not words. Which almost leads me to believe we need to do art therapy with Gen Z on how to pray. But that's... Maybe that's a different project. It's a lack of being able to dialogue with one another. Certainly not going to be able to dialogue with a God that you can't see. Or a God that we've told you is in this little piece. It looks like bread, but it's not bread. It's Jesus. I know it has the accidents of bread, but it's Jesus. And then you've entered into a whole other conversation about the Eucharist. And then we all know what the P research said about the transubstantiation. And is that the body of Christ? And then we've got a whole other crisis on our hands. So let's look at Gen Z. I'm sorry to not depress you about the failure of our church these days. But I, I, it's worth looking at the landscape. Gen Z, 34% of the sample size from Barna, no religious affiliation whatsoever. The N-O-N-E-S's. Gen Z is being raised by Gen X. 
For so long, we've leaned on the idea that faith is given in homes, right? Moms and dads are the first teachers of the faith. So that leads me to believe that the Gen Xers don't have the faith to give. Their kids have not been given the gift that ideally would have been given generationally. That they didn't grow up with the crucifix on the wall. They didn't grow up with mom and dad saying grace before meals. They're not growing up with church is something we do and it's who we are. I, I went to a Catholic school my whole life and I remember we, st- we came back from the summer and the teacher was doing this activity with us. It was 7th grade and she was asking us about our summers and my family always took a trip to Gatlinburg, Tennessee. That was like our big family vacation. And she, she was, you know, every kid is describing all the stuff that they do, and you're supposed to write this, like, page-long essay, like, describing your family summer. So I'm describing this family vacation. And I talked about, in my little essay, we went to this parish in Gatlinburg that's, like, known for being the vacationer's church. Because it's Gatlinburg. Like, people don't live in Gatlinburg. You visit Gatlinburg. And I described how the church, I loved it, because it was, like, this church in the woods. And, like, in the back window, you could see into the Smoky Mountains, and it was blue. And I described in the little essay that the blue was like this light blue, and I'd never seen a church painted light blue before. I'd only ever seen church with like stone walls or like a gray color, so I I liked the color of the church. And so every student would write a little essay, and we'd stand up at the front of the classroom, and we'd read it out loud, and I'm reading about the church with the blue walls and the windows in the back, and my family going to Dollywood, and my family doing all this hiking in the Smoky Mountains. And a friend came up to me afterwards and was like, your family goes to church when they're on vacation? I was like, well, yeah, you have to go to church on Sundays. Like, that's a thing. You have to go to church. Oh, well, we just take vacations off. And, like, that was the norm. I think is the norm. Right? And this is pre-masstimes.org, by the way. Like, this is my mom flipping through a phone book in Gatlinburg, finding the parish that we were going to go to, like, making an effort to make that a priority. These are the barriers. So of that sample size of the 34% that said, I'm not attached, here's what's keeping them from becoming attached. Here's what's keeping them from becoming Christian, engaging in the church. 29% have a hard time believing a good God allows suffering. Bad stuff happens. There's no explanation. I thought God was good. I have no way to grapple with this. I also think that shows us that there's intense suffering happening within generations. There's deep wounds that we gloss over because we live lives in three by three squares with filters or 140 characters of like pithy comments. So they're, they're dealing with weighted heavy things that they have no way of processing and then they're blaming a God that they have no relationship with. 23% Christians are hypocrites. That's not hard for me to believe at all. 20% Science refutes too much of the Bible. So that's a, an intellectual hang up. That's what Bishop Barron's work is, the new apologetics, a renewal of explanation of of what we believe. I would always blow my students' minds as a teacher, tell them that the Big Bang Theory was created and and discussed by a Catholic priest, and they'd always be like, that's not possible. The church doesn't like science. It's like, yeah, we kind of invented it. Like, it's our thing. (laughs) And it was just always this mental hang-up of, no, because y'all don't believe that stuff now. And then the language would break down because they didn't know how to argue against it because it was just always this assumption. They watched way too many alien documentaries on the History Channel. 15%, too many injustices in the history of Christianity. Again, bad things have happened that have never been fixed or explained or we've moved beyond. 12%. I used to go to church, but it's not important anymore. A lack of relevance. I grew up. I aged out of that. That's for kids. That's one of uh, Richard Dawkins' big arguments. That, like Faith is for the person who's scared to die, for the childish man or woman who is, just needs to hold on to something. And that's perpetuated. Just go click on Reddit, ask me anything about atheism, and that's what's there. Like Christians are mocked and thought to be childish because we're holding on to something that is bigger and mysterious. And mystery, rather than something to be dwelled within, is something to be solved. And so I think that's just a, a, again, we've got this fascination with the supernatural, but it's a fascination of the supernatural because I want to solve it. It started with Scooby-Doo and Nancy Drew, right? Like, I've got to figure out the mystery, and I've got to pull the mask off the person's head and find out who's actually there, as opposed to a reveling in something that cannot be explained but can be believed. Keep going. Reason that church attendance isn't important. 59% the church isn't relevant to me personally. 48% I find God elsewhere. I actually find hope in that. They're at least looking for God. And maybe they found him somewhere else. So God is not just foreign, but maybe God can be found in nature. Maybe I find God through my friends. I can find God through community. At least they're looking. 28% I can teach myself what I need to know. 20% the church is out of date. 
12%, the rituals are empty. Those last two I saw firsthand this summer at St. Minard, Indiana. They do this wonderful program called One Bread, One Cup. It's like liturgical training camp for teenagers to learn essentially how as laymen and women they can engage within the life of the church. And every day, one of the priests that was there with us, we've got Benedictine monks that are there on campus, but also some diocesan priests, would do like a brief five-minute teaching on something that, from the outside looking in, is kind of weird as Catholics. Like, we got some weird stuff, like relics? It's a weird thing to explain to a non-Catholic. Like, yeah, I've got a piece of this guy's hair, and I, I, you know, like, that's weird. It's a weird thing. Yeah, we have this red little light above this golden box, and we believe Jesus is inside. That's weird for somebody that doesn't know anything about it. And so they would just explain a thing, a ritual, a sacramental, something, and it was the kid's favorite part. Because they were being given an explanation for something that they just always knew was there. Culturally, experientially. But now they understood that red light signifies presence. That hair keeps us attached to the life of this person that we're trying to imitate. That kissing of the gospel, that kissing of the altar, that stole, like all the different little things. I, I, we always do this walk through Mass at my parish with the second graders before First Communion where Father essentially brings them up close and takes them point by point in second grade, seven-year-old language through what's happening up there. So that it's not just this foreign thing. The, the, the best thing I think Tommy and I do as parents is sit in the front freaking row with our two-year-old who squawks like a duck. Because I want her to see. And, and a lady fussed at me last week. We went into the cry room and I was like kind of whispering in Rose's ear as the priest was say, preaching the gospel, just telling her, like, he's telling us a story because I wanted her to listen. And we love story time at home, so she's going to love story time here. And the mom looked over at me and she went, this is a cry room, it's a room for silence. And my husband shot her this death glare <laughs> of like, who the hell do you think you are? And we took Rose and we went and sat smack dab in the front of the church to just kind of like shove in her face like she has every right to be here. And I want her to understand these rituals that are, are there. As pastors, are you encouraging your families to have that space and that place? Are you encouraging kids to come and ask those questions? Are we accompanying them and sharing without fear, like we talked about this morning? Or do they find it intimidating? Or scary? Or I'm going to be laughed at because I don't know the answer to that. Or I'm going to be thought I'm dumb because I, I dare to wonder. A sense of wonder a sense of curiosity is the gateway to faith. If we look at the six common reasons for disaffiliation from the St. Mary's Going, Going, Gone study, there's an implication of community, an implication of family, and an implication of leadership within the church. An event or a series of events or insight triggered a process of questioning and doubt. And oftentimes when that questioning and doubt occurs, somebody might go looking for an answer, they might shut down completely, they find the answer, they don't agree with the answer, they ask for the answer, nobody gives them the answer, or they're told that they're dumb for asking for that, or they just don't go looking at all. Cultural secularization led some to see faith and religion as options. Disaffiliation brought a sense of happiness, relief, or freedom. Religion was forced on them as kids and they don't want to do the same, it's now a choice. Living a moral life doesn't require religious belief. Belief is based on rational arguments only, and if those aren't presented, they leave. Now, St. Mary's Press, when they did this study, also found that the average age of disaffiliation is 13. That is 7th grade. So you confirm 8th grade, so you might have already lost a lot of them. And they're getting confirmed because they don't want their grandma to cry. But yet, they have no concept of that... And we've, we've pitched confirmation wrong for years. You're not choosing something. Something's being confirmed within you. But it's another <laughs> semantic conversation for later. And I, I think there's another reason here that we're not identifying, and it's a very common reason among young adults. And it's a lack of welcome that is experienced in the life of the church. And it's the cliquish nature of Catholicism that even forms within ministry. Even forms within communities of priests. Like there's four groups of priests in my diocese and I know which one I'm going to go to for which question I have and who I'd rather come to dinner than not. Right? So like even the people perceive that segmentation and rather than organic communities have formed, it's this, this blockade that's created among people based off of preferences or based off of, of personalities or, or, or just based off of, of what you think will bring life but is instead actually very isolating and excluding. And I've got an anecdotal story to back this up from my sister-in-law. My husband was a diocesan director of youth ministry in Scranton, Pennsylvania. So he worked for the church. Raised in a family with a Protestant father and a Catholic mother, but his Protestant father went to Mass every Sunday and often says that he would be Catholic if it wasn't for the paperwork. We're working on him slowly. I'm praying for him. But he's like more Catholic than a lot of Catholic people I know. 
And my, my sister-in-law, Sarah, went off to college uh, in Scranton. She went to King's College, so a Holy Cross University, was around Catholic priests for years, moved down to Nashville as soon as she graduated to start working for the CMA Awards. She works in the music industry in Nashville, very secular world, very money-driven world, but she continued to go to church every Sunday. That was a priority. It was something she was raised with. Even with a Protestant father, Mass was a priority in their family. And she went to this parish in Nashville, good small community parish. I've been there a few times because when we visit, that's the church that Tommy and I will go to because it's not far from where she lives. And she went, and for six straight weeks, she'd go to Mass, and after Mass, she'd go say hello to the priest who's standing outside greeting people. And every week, the priest would go, remind me who you are again? And then eventually, it, it became like he wasn't asking her who you are. It was just like this complete unrecognition that she was anybody possibly new to the area or possibly new to the parish community or possibly needed a welcoming word or possibly needed to be introduced to other people. She was also told a couple different times that she was sitting in somebody's spot. I don't know that the priest can correct that problem. I think that's just old ladies need to give up their spots sometimes. But she felt alone. And for young adults, one in five of whom have a diagnosable anxiety disorder, walking into an empty church or a full church or just a church with a hodgepodge of people and not knowing where to sit, not knowing anybody there, and knowing that nobody knows who you are. And then Father doesn't even know who you are and didn't take the time to learn your name. So she stopped going. I know some people think, that's a dumb reason to leave the Eucharist because nobody knew your name. But every time Jesus talked to somebody, he learned their name. And she stopped going to church completely, lying to her mom about it, telling her that she was still continuing to go to church on Sundays. A co-worker of hers overheard one day that she was you know, looking for a church community, just in general, like she, and she used that very basic language, church community. Her friend invited her to come to Cross Point, which is one of the largest non-denominational churches in Nashville. Sarah went. She was greeted with an iPad at the door asking for her contact information, given a coupon to the coffee shop in the welcome area, a swag bag with the pastor's book, and some like earplugs because it's so loud in the main arena of their church. And it wasn't, and I am not saying as Catholics we need iPads and coffee shops and earplugs. It's not the equation I'm, I'm getting to. But the, the secret sauce of that church was that when the service was over, the person that invited her, who sat with her the whole time, asked her what she thought, asked her if she'd like to go get breakfast, invited her to become part of a small group community at the church, told her, this is a place where we want you to be, and if you think, well, that's really sad that she, we lost one, it's not just sad that we lost one, we lost her family. Because when Sarah got married in the church, I promise you, she only got married in the church so that my mother-in-law wouldn't cry. And then when Emma was born, she declared to all of us, my daughter will not be baptized. And so her disaffiliation has implications generationally because my niece is not baptized. And oftentimes my mother-in-law will lean over to me at a family dinner and be like, can we just take her to the bathroom and do it real quick? I just have to tell her, like, no, my kin-in-law sister said no. I've asked all the time. Like, this is not okay. It's not an emergency. She has not asked us to do this. But the disaffiliation of one who felt unwelcomed and isolated and unseen has led to the disaffiliation of her child. And I imagine her future children. And before we think, well, it's just one. We've got a much bigger church to deal with than just one. Last time I checked, the only job that any of us have is the salvation of souls, especially those of you in college. Like, you literally, that's what you've given your life to. And that one soul was lost because of one guy who looked at her and just didn't ever take the time to learn her name. And so, yeah, we can look at the big picture issues. They've got big questions, and they, they, they don't agree with something, or there's a moral hang-up, but there's also a very personal, there's no place for me in this church. And yeah, it's not about us, but it is kind of about us. Because Jesus came for us particularly. Now, what do the church-going teens think? What about the ones that have stayed? Again, we ask that, that right question. What kept them there? What keeps them there? 82%, the church is a place to find answers, to live a meaningful life. I've asked, and I've sought, and I've been told. So the ones that are here have, have achieved what the ones who aren't here are maybe looking for. So how do we promote to them better? How do we tell them in, in, in more visible and obvious ways that we have answers to those big questions? This is one of the things that Life Teen is doing with their new confirmation program, Purpose. Rather than stage it as learn the faith, Catholicism 101, let's talk about what life means. Let's talk about what it means to live in the Spirit. Let's talk about what it means to be a person of prayer. Let's talk about what goodness can come in your life when you have a relationship with the Blessed Sacrament. 82% the church is relevant for my life. An ancient 
church, ever ancient church, is also what? Ever new. And that sometimes that attachment to the tradition and the things of old are actually more relevant in a world of 2019 constant change than anything else. 77%, I can be myself at church. It's a place of authenticity. It's a place of, of, of welcome. A place where I don't have to hide. That was one of the things I think I was most proud of in my parish youth ministry program was that our youth house, which was a house with a living room and a kitchen and an outdoor space, was just a, a place where kids were welcome to just be. And we did Bible study. We had like formal things that we did. And we would go to the church for adoration once, once a month for our time of prayer. But it was a place where a kid could come in. I had a cell phone check by the door, so I'd ask them to not bring their phones in the building and just simply hang out. And you could almost see like all those, those lines of division that existed in our school of popular kids and unpopular kids and band geeks and jocks and the nerdy, nerdy kids and then the girls that were really, really sweet and then the girls that were really, really mean, like just all the stereotypes that you could imagine. You'd walk into that youth house and it, it just melted away. It was a place of comfort. It was one of the things I was most proud of, that, that it didn't matter their social status in other areas of their life. The youth house was just a generalizing home for all of them. And I think when we hear a young person say, I can be myself at church, it's because we've turned it into a home rather than an institution. And the church is not an NGO. The church is a body. And bodies breathe, and bodies bleed. <coughs> bodies have emotions, and bodies move. Bodies are, are something we are comfortable in. 63%, the people at church are understanding and tolerant. Not words that describe many Christians, but the ones who are there do describe it as that. So maybe there is a way that our understanding and our tolerance, and tolerance doesn't just mean acceptance, and accompaniment doesn't just mean wandering in the wrong direction, we all know that, but there's, a, 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 again, a sense of authenticity. They also think this, though. We do have to look at some of the things that church-going teens think are possibly negative. 36% people at church are hypocritical. 27% the church is not a safe place to express doubts. 24% the faith and teachings I encounter at church seem rather shallow. They're not looking for fluff. They're looking for steak. Because they can get fluff anywhere. And they can find BS answers on the internet anytime they want. So are we dumbing things down rather than challenging them to elevate their minds and their hearts and live for something? rather than just accept something passively. 17%, the church seems too much like an exclusive club. Again, I walk into a building, I don't know anybody there, I don't know where to sit, and I'm not smiled at, I get a look. Or I sit down in the wrong place, and somebody like shoves me over. Or, and this one, I, I've had to have multiple conversations with the ushers at my parish. The usher walks up to you and like strong arms you into bringing the gifts up. It's like, I don't want to do that. Like, I don't want to bring the gifts up. Oh, yeah, but that's how you serve Jesus. And so like, we expect things of people that they're not ready to give just yet. I don't want to walk in. I'm a lifelong 30-year-old Catholic who talks about Jesus for a living, and I don't want to bring the gifts up. I don't want to do it. And you ask me every week, and it makes me uncomfortable every week. Right? So just, maybe that's just my own personal problem. <laughs> now... I always like to cite this one particular study. The USCCB every year gives us evidence and proof of what got priests into that year, right? Like they look at the, the stats of the class. And I'm always blown away by the things that, that the young men that are ordained every year are citing and agreeing with. So how old were you when you first considered a vocation to the priesthood? The largest percentage are children when they first consider it. Elementary school, six to 13. Again, if we know that disaffiliation on average happens a lot in those 7th and 8th grade years, what are we doing to foster and promote a sense of service and love of Jesus and the church? And let me tell you, sometimes I, I sit back and think to myself that there are men in this world who have chosen to give their lives to the service of the people of God, and I almost get emotional at the thought that there are men that chose that and chose to give their lives to that. And it makes me so happy. And then I get really, really scared that we're not promoting that love in the next generation. And that we're not articulating that to those young men. And when their children, little boys at six years old, told about a heroic life of virtue, to essentially be, be victors in the church, to, to be not, not kings, that's not the knights in the church. You're not a king, you're, you're a servant. Um, <laughs> let's make that very clear. To engender within that, that, that desire to give. How are, we, how are we using that critically important formational time 
most come and see retreats for young men are not until well into high school. Like 16 years old, they might already have a very hardened heart and mind. And I'm not saying we bring seven-year-olds to the seminary. Like that might, that might not work on either level. But are we articulating to them the life that they could have and the way that they could live that heroic priesthood and inspiring that within their hearts? Did you participate in any of these prayer practices or groups on a regular basis before entering the seminary? 75% of last year's ordination class cited Eucharistic adoration as critically important for the development of their vocation. Again, I get paid to talk about Jesus for a living, and nothing I ever say will be as good as any time that a young person sits in front of the Blessed Sacrament, even if they don't know what they're doing, even if they're confused, even if they don't have anything to say, even if they think that they're not feeling anything. That time in front of Jesus... In our youth ministry programs, within our parish life, is Eucharistic adoration a priority and available? There's a parish in Lafayette, Louisiana, and, and I love this place. They built an adoration chapel, and like nobody was going to it. And like nobody was signing up for perpetual adoration hours, and like it just wasn't, like the community did not respond very well. So the pastor, about 20 years ago, had an idea. He's like, I think people don't like going because it's uncomfortable. It's not a very welcoming room. It's just like pews. And like we all know pews are not great. Even with cushions on them. Like they're just not comfortable places to be. And church is not necessarily supposed to be a comfortable place. And I'm not saying we put lazy boys in the... I'm not saying that. But in the pastor's mind, he wanted people to come to Eucharistic Adoration because he knew the fruits that would be born of spending time with our Lord. Because he's seen that in his own life, in his daily holy hour. So he bought lazy boys. He bought very comfortable armchairs and put them in their adoration chapel. Just a few. Still had his pews in the front, but just a few in the back. And the numbers skyrocketed. Skyrocketed. So he was right. His theory was right. The pews were uncomfortable. People want to spend time with Jesus, but their butts hurt. So I'm going to put them in a comfortable chair. Last year, they had to rebuild that adoration chapel to make it twice the size because it was filling up. And a, a picture of it was posted on the Lafayette Diocese website and I retweeted it not long ago and got into a fight with some rad trads about it all because they were like, we're not called to be comfortable, we're called to sit with our, you know, Jesus and suffer. It's like, yeah, it was no picnic on that cross, but there is Easter Sunday, so let's rejoice in resurrection and, and, and choose to be with our Lord and recognize the value of that. But here's why I'm telling you this story. That, that parish, 20 years ago, starting that adoration chapel, putting lazy boys in it, has yielded seven priests in 20 years. I don't, I, it's correlation, I'm not going to say that there's a scientific, put a lazy boy, get a priest, but I do think, <laughs> I do think that time in front of Jesus yields fruit. It yields fruit. And I'll also say this, my bishop, in his personal chapel, there are two pews and there's a very comfortable chair in the corner, and I am fairly certain he's sitting in a very comfortable chair when he's doing his holy hour every morning. We've got to put people in front of Jesus, maybe we have to figure out a way to get them there in the first place. And I'm not saying holy hours with teenagers from the start. Like holy 15 minutes might be a really good introduction. Holy half hours. Right? Introducing them to rote forms of prayer that lead to personal forms of prayer, that lead to spontaneous forms of prayer, that lead to worship. Right? You walk into a youth conference, a Steubenville youth conference, it's the first time. If you're a 14-year-old kid and you walk up for the first time and you see somebody praising on the front row, you're not going to do that right away. The same way we expect young people to come to church and be like fully invested in full active participants and they're like, they still don't quite understand what's going on even though they've been going their whole life. This evidence, or this, this, all these stats yield a few things that I think we have to think about in light of Christus view it especially. Because all of those stats, that's all information that was unpacked at the Synod. That's all stuff that was talked about at the pre-synod in March of 2018. It's all things that factored into the document and then the letter that Francis had wrote us. And, and here's what we've learned from all of this. First of all, our answers matter. Our answers to big questions of faith, of life, they matter. And not just the answer. Hey, am I allowed to sleep with somebody before I'm married? The right answer is no. It's the right answer. But what's the follow-up sentence? Is it no period or is it no dot, dot, dot? Let's dialogue. Let's engage. You tell me you love this person. What do you love about him? Do you care about him? Do you want to marry them someday? Let's, let's have a further conversation about this question that you've asked. I think I'm gay, Father. What, what does that mean for my life? 
oh, well, you know, homosexuality is condemned. That's not the answer that we're supposed to give. And it's not the way we engage in dialogue with the young person who's struggling with matters of homosexuality, struggling with the transgender question. And, and, and as a side note, when it comes to concerns, questions, and challenges within this the sexuality crisis that we're having in our country right now and having in our culture in general, we're not seen as the good guys in the culture. Y'all know that, right? We're seen as the bad guys, even though we're the ones that not just teach the fullness of truth, but actually love the people that are struggling. And yet we're not seen as the ones that love because our messaging is really off. Not the truth, the way we present it. Francis has this to say in Christus Vivit, but church always on the defensive, always on the defensive, which loses her humility and stops listening to others, which leaves no room for questions, loses her youth and turns into a museum. One of the big themes of the document from the Synod that then bears out in Christus Vivit is the idea of listening. It's a huge theme of, of Christus Vivit, that when we listen, two things happen. Not just gather information. That's important. We need to learn. But we adopt the disposition of God, who is a listener, who is one who listens. And as my Cajun mama would say, you have two ears and one mouth for a reason, because you are supposed to listen twice as much as you talk. So the church that answers, answers only after having first heard. Responds to the big question, responds to the concern, responds to the challenge, responds to the hate. With that docility and humility and desire to respond, as we said this morning, charitably with the truth. That's one of the major themes that we're seeing bear out. The other, and we mentioned this this morning with the folks that were here, intentional companionship is key. Young people that stick with the faith often cite five adults within their life that stuck with them in their journey of faith. The five to one method. You all know those people. And fathers, I would encourage you to think about the men and women in your life that not just encouraged your vocation, but just encouraged your love of Jesus, which led to a vocation. And I say voca vocation to the priesthood. We all have vocations. We all have the vocation to holiness. You know what I mean. Think about those people who walked with you who talked with you, who answered your questions, who are still there for you today. This, this meeting that I was at, my, my friend Father John Burns, who just got back from Rome, he just finished his PhD in moral theology, he's back in Milwaukee, he's a vocations recruiter, we're sitting at a bar with a whole group of people, I was next to him, we haven't seen each other in like a year because we've both been really busy. And so I was just like, how's it going? Like, I know you're, you, you, do you miss parish life? And he's like, yeah, I do, I miss the people. But I really love getting to walk with young men as they're like figuring out, if, is this what God wants for their life? Is this what they're called to? And so I asked him, does it ever get lonely? You know, you go back home to a, a house of discernment and your room, from what you've told me, is up on the third floor. And, so, and these guys are in college and they're working jobs and like you're flitting all over the place and you've just got like, life is busy. Is it ever isolating? Is it ever lonely? And he said, yeah, it, it absolutely is. To have other people in your life that you can consistently turn to and let them know, hey, I skipped my holy hour for the past three days. I need you to call me on that. Hey, I, I really need to pray with somebody or talk through something or like I'm having these struggles or these questions or these emotions, right? Like to find those people that you can consistently rely on. And he was literally articulating to me that as a priest of the past 15 years with a PhD and like a pretty high power job in his diocese still needs to be accompanied every single day. So companionship is not just a, I companion you, and now I'm done companioning you. It's a journey. It's a walk with and walk beside. CV talks about this. The community, the whole community, is part of this companionship, has an important role in the accompaniment of young people. It should feel collectively responsible for accepting, motivating, encouraging, and challenging them. Here's, here's my biggest concern in the trends of youth ministry since 1989 on. We have a lot of youth ministers who minister to young people, but we do not have a lot of youth mentors within a parish community who recognize the witness that they can give. And as youth ministers with a job to articulate and to lead and to structure youth ministry, your job is not just to engage with teenagers. Your job is to engage with a whole community and empower all of them. Every person in that parish is responsible for being an authentic witness to the young people walking through, to the young people who are not showing up to the young people that they bump into in the grocery store, pass by on the street, are volunteering with in the confirmation retreat, are seeing, sit next to their parents at Mass. There's a, a young family in my diocese, they have nine kids under the age of 10. So Mass is a challenge for them. And they often sit pretty close to the front at the parish that they go to, and it's just kind of like known amongst the parish 
that some of the grandmas in the parish need to sit kind of close to just help, to pick up the two-year-old who's got snot coming out of his nose, to go take the three-year-old to the water fountain, to take the four-year-old out to run to the bathroom because they just finished their potty training. And it's, it's beautiful to see. I will never have nine children. I do not think that's what the Lord has called me to. And I look at them and I just I see heroic domestic church being played out and a community loving that domestic church. And if you think, okay, well, what does that have to do with youth ministry? That's youth ministry. Because it's engaging with young people and the whole community is supporting them in that moment of prayer. And the formalized, you bring the kids to DYC, you chaperone in CYC, you cook a meal for the confirmation class. And fathers, as pastors, as associate pastors, I know associate pastors like a fake term, but as parochial vicars, is that the real term? Parochial vicars? As guys in parishes who are responsible for the life of your people. As the man in charge. Encouraging within your youth minister, hired or volunteer, and amongst the community as a whole, that it is a collective responsibility and does not fall on the shoulders of one person whose job it is to fix the problems of young people. And also, while we're talking about that, if we're using young people to stuff bulletins or to clean up after the Easter vigil or to do the projects of our parish because young people are energetic and you know they can do things and they're strong, that's usury. That's not fostering relationships with young people. That's using them as free labor. That's, that's saying, well, yeah, we're engaging in the life of the parish because we're getting them to do the things that we don't want to do or we're too old or fat to do. That's not okay. Because they need service help. Well, they do need service hours. Yeah, absolutely. But like, what would it look like if that young person, and, and this is a, I've been banging this drum since the synod finished. Every parish council, which is a canonical thing that you're required to have, should have a young person on the parish council. And when I say young person, again, it's pretty wide age range. I'm talking high schooler, I'm talking college student, I'm talking young adult, single, and young adult married. If your parish council is 55 plus white hairs, you're not doing it right. And I'm saying that as somebody who cannot wait to have white hair. And I'm saying that as somebody whose parents are on the parish council, and I often poke fun at my parents, that how did you two end up on it? Married couple, very isolated, and nobody under the age of 30 is on there. There's a way to engage and a way to empower. We also are encouraged in Christus Vivit, and Francis says this very clearly, to plant roots, to attach our young people to the, the depths and traditions of our faith, not because we want them to become rigid and so structured that they have nothing else to lean on, but because when you have deep roots, the tree can grow further. And he, he talks a lot about prayer and how young people should never be underestimated. That in fact, we should never underestimate the ability of young people to be open to contemplative prayer. We need only find the right ways and means to help them embark on this precious experience. We sometimes don't want to bring young people further or deeper because we're worried that they're not ready. And sometimes they're not. And sometimes you don't want to feed steak to a six-month-old who's never tried peas before, of course. But we write teenagers off sometimes. We write off that question that they asked as, oh, they don't want to believe in this, instead of it's genuine curiosity about the mystery. Or maybe they got a little squirrely or squirmy the last time we did Eucharistic Adoration, so we don't want to do it again because that's disrespectful to our Lord. St. Therese fell asleep in the chapel on the regular. So I'm okay with a teenage boy being a little squirmy. Because she became a saint after napping. So I think he could become a saint after getting up to go to the bathroom two or three times because he doesn't know how to sit still because that's, he doesn't have a prefrontal cortex. That's normal. <laughs> right? We should never underestimate. And oftentimes I think that's what we've done with teenagers, especially. We keep them below us. And we sit on high. As opposed to in the round, side by side, journeying next to Francis cites quite a bit in Christus Vivit, and you'll see this as you read it, and your homework assignment is to read it, and it's 299 chapters because the committee got going and then Francis got involved and they just didn't know how to stop, and the Vatican's not good at editing, and we all know that, but it's worth reading. But he references quite a bit a story that we're going to talk about and unpack in a few minutes, The Road to Emmaus. And again, if we think we're better than The Road to Emmaus, then we're not, because how does Jesus do it? He asks the question. He listens to the answer. Then he teaches. And he doesn't do it by running in front of them and saying, come on, guys, hurry up. He walks side by side with them. I imagine fairly slowly. I don't think Jesus was in a rush much. And we're often in too much of a rush. The last big theme that, that Francis points out quite a bit, and we see this again from the data, is a feeling of, I want to be connected and attached and comfortable with church. 
We saw that in the church-going teens that, that are there, I can be myself. It's a place that's relevant to me. People are there that answer my questions and, and they listen to me. So this idea that the church is home, that the church is a place of familiarity, a place of comfort, a place of belonging, not distant and cold. When I was at the USCCB in June of 2018, so post-pre-synod but before the big synod, and me and my two other delegates, Nick Lopez and Brother Javier, who had gone to this priest and were addressing the bishops, they gave us 45 minutes. We ended up taking 90. Because bishops ask a lot of questions, and they just let the questions kind of roll. And it was really very cool, again, very intimidating, to stand in a room of all bishops and tell them what we thought and tell them what we knew to be true and ask of them certain things. And so it ends, this great question, and this was also like three days before all the McCarrick scandal stuff struck, so I often go back to that room and think church before, church after, and I was in that room church before. So it, I have a little existential crisis every time I ponder it. I might need to go to confession with one of you guys later on. And I, we're going down the escalator to get to the bar, because Brother Javier has a flight to catch, and Nick and I are just exhausted. This is an exhausting 90 minutes answering these questions and giving our insights. And as we're riding down the escalator, Monsignor Bransfield, who's the General Secretary of the USCCB, comes up behind us. He's a very tall man. And his like, shadow is overpowering us as we're riding down this escalator. He was like, um, the Cardinals have requested that the three of you ride on their bus to Mass this evening. And I like look back up at him and I'm about to say, like, I was about to go to the bar to have a glass of wine. And he was like, if you just go out that door right there, the bus is waiting. So I've now been coerced into going to Mass with the bishops and riding on the Cardinals bus. And I get on the bus, and it was as intimidating as you can imagine it being. The Cardinals of the United States, of which there's like less than 12, are sitting there on this bus, and up walks little Katie Prejean in her white dress, and I, I pop onto the bus, and there's one seat available that doesn't have a cardinal in it, and so I duck into that seat. Because how do you just like sit down next to a prince of the church? I mean, I guess you, you do, but I wasn't about to. And I sit down in this, this row, and who gets on the bus like five minutes later but Cardinal Tobin of Newark? And he sits down next to me, the only other open seat on the bus. And a couple of things that you need to know about Cardinal Tobin. First, he's a big man. He looks a little like Mike Pompeo, the Secretary of State. So like every time I see him on the screen, I think, oh, that's the Cardinal. Um, Broad-shouldered, he sits down and his broad shoulders are like squeezing me up against the window of this little bus. And the bus takes off and we're driving to a church in the Diocese of Miami. We're in Fort Lauderdale. We're driving to the church. Um, and the conversation just kind of takes off between the two of us. And he was thanking me for the things that I said. And I was asking him just about life as a Cardinal. Like how much of your schedule is your own? Like how busy are your days? I was just curious. Like I'd love for all the Cardinals to do like a day in the life on their Instagram stories and just like show us what what do you do because it looks like you don't do anything and I know that's not true so I just I wanted to know I was just curious and like pull the veil back a little bit like show me your life and then we're chatting we're talking and he he mentioned just kind of offhandedly that all of his siblings he's one of 13 are they're all still Catholic and I, I was like, that's not true. Like, I, I accused him of lying. <laughs> and he kind of, like, did a double take. My guard was way down at this point. I, all I wanted was wine, and now I'm on this bus. And, and I was like, there's no way that's true. And he's like, no, it's true. It's the thing my mother is most proud of. You know, we all have professional degrees and have done well in our field, and, and, but we're all still Catholic. And I, I just look at him, and I'm like, that's not... That is not what the statistics show. Like, it's just not. Like, it's just not. It's, there's disaffiliation in mass amongst families. Like, it's just not true. And so I say, well, what's the secret sauce? Like, what kept y'all Catholic? And there was kind of a long pause, because I don't think he was expecting me to ask that question. I was not expecting a lot of things to happen. And he looks off in the distance, and he looked exactly like I thought a cardinal would look like when they're thinking. And he's just like... <laughs> Pondering, and I kind of wish I'd taken a photo at that moment. And, and he looks back down at me, and, and this is the other thing about Cardinal Tobin. I think cardinals just get in the habit of repeating a person's name when they're talking to them so that they don't forget the name as they're talking to them. And he was like, you know, Katie, you know, I think Katie, he said my name like five times before he wound up. And he went, the church has just always been home. And you don't leave home. And I, we rode in silence for like the next 10 minutes of the ride because I just, he knew, and I, it's like almost like he read my soul in that moment that I just needed a moment to process that. And I started thinking about the concept of home. 
And like I have lived, I have purchased two houses and have a mortgage and I live at 1428 Wedgwood Street and that's home for me. But when I really think about home, I think about my mom and dad's house on 4243 Holly Hill Road that I can walk through that front door, kick my shoes off in the exact same place I've always kicked them off, plop down on the couch that's been there since 1995 when we moved in, turn the TV on because it's the only place that has cable in anybody in my life, go make a cup of coffee in the kitchen, find all the things that I would need to find in the pantry, run upstairs and lay down in the, my childhood bed, which is still in my room. But when I think of home, I think of where my parents are. And I think of the comfort that I feel or like the safe havenness. There was a, um, a tropical storm that came through Lake Charles earlier this summer. And even though my husband and I have a house not in a flood zone and in a perfectly fine place that wasn't going to lose power, we still went to my parents' house because that was a place where we could be safe in the storm. Even though I have my home. And like Rose will probably always associate our house as her home. And what about home captures our imagination and makes us comfortable? It's a place of safety. It's a place of belonging. It's a place where I am heard. It's a place where I am loved, even in the midst of chaos and questioning. A place of correction. I got punished in that home a whole heck of a lot, but I still continued to go back. And it still was my place of safety. Francis has this to say about the church's home. In a word, to create a home is to create a family. And if the church is home, that means the people in the church are family to one another. It is to learn to feel connected by more than merely utilitarian and practical bonds. To be united in such a way is to feel that our life is a bit more human. Does the church make us feel a bit more human? To create a home is to let prophecy take flesh, make our hours and days less cold, less indifferent, and anonymous. And if Father, and the youth minister, or the greeter doesn't know your name, you don't feel less anonymous. You feel unseen, unimportant, and unloved. It's to create bonds by simple, everyday acts that all of us can perform. I think the reason Rose loves the sign of peace so much is because she gets to make eye contact with people. And the rest of the time that we're in church, she's just looking at people's butts if we're not in the front row. <laughs> and as a two-year-old, that's a tough thing to do. Are we fostering moments of intentional encounter, simple everyday acts that we can all perform to know that this is a place where I belong? For the young person who feels loose and constantly in transition and is attached to a screen that is constantly updating and that this information highway is, they are cruising along and have never not been on, is the church a place of respite? The church a place of, of stability? Along these lines, our institutions should provide young people with places they can make their own, where they can come and go freely, feel welcome, and readily meet other young people, whether times of difficulty and frustration or of joy and celebration. Fathers, have you dedicated a specific area in your church parish for young people to go? Is there a youth room? Is there a youth house? Is there just a place? And I'm not just talking a hall that a janitor is going to come behind and clean up and fuss at the youth minister because they forgot to throw away the solo cups the night before, but a place that a young person can claim that they feel comfortable in, that their guard can come down in. And I get that there's limits of the budget. I get that there's limits of space. I get that that's not always the thing that you think you have to have. But in about 20 years, they're the ones that are going to be tithing. So if we haven't given them the places now, then we're not going to have them in 20 years, and the doors are going to shutter, and the lights are going to go off, and you won't have a youth minister to pay in the first place. All should regard young people with understanding, appreciation, and affection. Let's look at those words again. Burn them into your memory. We should regard young people with understanding, appreciation, not because they've done something, because of just the fact that they exist, and affection. Have you ever talked to a seventh grade boy? Like if you can get him still long enough to have a conversation with him? <laughs> Especially with the crisis of fatherhood and the crisis of authentic masculinity and femininity in the world today. Anytime I do middle school events, and I don't do a lot of middle school events anymore, because I just, I've learned that that is not my gift. But most 7th grade boys especially, you know what they need the most? They don't need a phone, they don't need Fortnite, they don't need cash, they need a hug. 
Because at a certain point, their mom and dad assumed that their smelly little sixth or fifth grade boy didn't want hugs anymore, and so they stopped getting those hugs. And so in seventh grade, there's almost this like lack of affection that has been given to them because there's this assumption that they need to grow up. And they're 12, which means they're still a child. Affection that is shown willingly from the whole community. Love that is poured into these young people because it is love that gives life. Avoid constantly judging them or demanding of them a perfection beyond their years. When Francis wrote Christus Vivid, um, Father Jow, who's one of the priests in the dicastery, I had the privilege of interviewing him for a panel that we did at the National Federation Conference last year, and then he and I got dinner afterwards. And we're chatting, and we're talking, and, and I'm asking him questions about what he thinks is going to be in the document that's eventually going to come out. And he said, you know, Pope Francis reflects on quite a bit. I'm like, well, that's good. I mean, he's the Pope. He should reflect on a lot of things all the time. <laughs> and he said, you know, one of his favorite scripture passages is the story of the Gerasene demoniac. I was like, oh, that's fun information to know about the Pope. Like his favorite passage of the Bible. Tell me more, Father. And he starts to tell me that Francis will often preach on the Gerasene demoniac, even if it's not the gospel of the day. He'll tie in the story because of two big moments. And they were not the two moments I was expecting. We all know the story, right? There's this unnamed man. He doesn't have a name. We don't know his name. And he's ostracized. He's living on the outskirts of town, chained to the, the tombs. The people hate him. They fear him. He's, he's possessed by demons. And Jesus goes to this guy. He asks him his name. What is your name? He says, we are legion, for we are many. Legion's a number, 10,000. We all know the scriptural implications. And Jesus heals the guy. And in a moment of like weird compassion, but I also think kind of humor, Jesus doesn't just like destroy the demons right away. He casts the demons into, you know the story, he casts the demons into the swine herd, and the pigs run off the side of the hill. And I've got a historically accurate photo of the moment. So the pigs run off the side of the hill. <laughs> and on the one hand, I think it's Jesus' humor, because like he was Jewish, so he couldn't have bacon, so he's getting rid of bacon. <laughs> But then on the other hand, like even to demons, there's like a compassion of like destruction. And it's, I, I don't know all of the scriptural implications of this, but it always, it surprises me that like Jesus listened to their demand in some weird way. Don't destroy us. And then the man is no longer possessed by demons. And Jesus and the man start talking to each other. And it's talking to each other that the people find them together, sitting down. And it says that the people find them there on the outskirts of town. Their neighborhood-friendly demoniac, who doesn't have a name, is now healed. And he's talking to Jesus, and this detail is included in the scriptures. That they found the man from whom the demons had gone, sitting at the feet of Jesus, clothed in his right mind. And so Father John and I are talking about it. He's like, have you ever read that passage closely, Katie? And I was like, yeah. I mean, he's sitting down with Jesus, talking to him. He's like, no, no, no. Read it again. How is he sitting down with Jesus? I'm like, clothed and in his right mind? And Father Jow said, I don't know how English is, but in Spanish and in Italian and in French, it would just be assumed that a person is clothed. So for us to be told that he's clothed and in his right mind would imply that before when he was not in his right mind, he was naked. And he said, where did he get the clothes, Katie? And, you know, in the back of my head, I'm like, I don't know, maybe he had some under a rock. Like he was, I'm not a scripture scholar. This is not my job. You tell me. He went, where do you think he got the clothes? And I, I'm just kind of waiting for this wise, holy priest who works at the Vatican to tell me. And he said, you know, Francis often says that Jesus gave him the clothes off of his back. And it just hit me in the gut that one of our Pope's favorite passages in Scripture is one where he's reading the story of Jesus clothing someone who not just needed physical, spiritual, mental healing, but also needed a shirt that Jesus gave. Because in his ministry, Jesus did not just think big picture, and he did not just think 10,000 foot view, and he did not just think saving the world on the cross, and he did not just think Resurrection Sunday. He thought, the man in front of me needs something I can give. And so perhaps the only way to solve a disaffiliation crisis and the only way to fix the problem of young people leaving or young people not feeling relevant or young people feeling that the church is not relevant to them or young people having big questions that they're not given answers to, perhaps it's not 
a universal program we adopt. Perhaps it's not a 10 point step uh, implementation of ways to engage in dialogue. Perhaps it's we look at every young person who passes in front of us and we've engaged the whole community in this project and we think, what can I give them right now? The shirt off my back, the answer that they're longing for, the moment of prayer, the simply laughing together. What can I give that young person right now? We see this modeled again in that Road to Emmaus story, which is the model of evangelization that we are called to adopt as church. Right? In the movements of the Emmaus story, he walked with them. So they're walking along, and how are they walking along? In the wrong direction, right? They're headed away from Jerusalem, confused, scared, questioning. And Jesus pops out of the bushes. This ninja Jesus. We get a lot of Jesuses, right? You get sassy Jesus who doesn't answer questions. Angry Jesus flips over tables. Kind Jesus washes feet. And you get, you know, surprise Jesus who (laughs) comes out of a bush and starts having a conversation with you. And he asks them a question. What are you talking about? What are you talking about? A good question is not how are you. That's not a good question to a teenager because they're going to say fine. A good question would be, what's something that made you laugh this week? A good question would be, what are you watching on TV these days? And then go watch that YouTube channel to figure out how to talk to them afterwards. A good question is, is there something I can help you with? And then if they're like, no, no, I'm fine, are you sure? Which then gives them permission to actually tell you. Asking good questions. And as priests, empowering your community to know that they have permission to ask those good questions, but then reminding them, we don't just ask a question so we can formulate an answer. We ask a question so we can listen attentively. Because Jesus says, what are you talking about? Knowing full well what they're talking about. And then he listens to their very wrong answer. <laughs> oh, well, yeah, this crazy stuff has happened, and we're not quite sure what's going on. Like, he just, and like, he's the dude that this all happened to. And so still in humility, he listens. And he waits to jump in. And now everybody at this point is like, yeah, they're walking in the wrong direction. They're listening attentively to the wrong answer. Like, a company man is just wandering around aimlessly. But then the best part really comes up where the eyes are opened, right? That next movement of the story. And Jesus looks at them and what does he say? You fools. Now don't go call young people fools. You won't win any (laughs) points by doing that. But he calls them you fools and then he teaches. He gives the very best Bible study in the history of Bible studies. He explains to them salvation history. He talks to them about these moments. He tells them that they're part of that story. I spend most of my time talking to people about Jesus, and I'll guarantee most of the things that teenagers remember are not the profound theological points that I point out. They remember the stupid story I told about Rose saying, piss on an airplane. (laughs) Fathers, you missed that story this morning. Somebody else will tell you later. They remember the story of how I met my husband. They remember stories of, of... moments where I felt completely and totally alone in faith and it was proven that I was not. They remember the stories. They remember the witness. They remember life. And so when we proclaim truth, we are called to employ the rhetorical skill of storytelling. Now fathers, that doesn't mean you give a really crappy joke at the top of your homily. And if you're not a good joke teller, don't do them, please. (laughs) We don't want a pity laugh. We don't. But your story as father. You know, my, my favorite thing to ask priests is, What's your favorite part of being a priest? Because I love that answer. I think it revealed a lot about them. And what, what, how'd you get here? What's your vocation story? Do, do, your, do your parishioners know that? Do they know how nervous you might have been when you went off to seminary for the first time? How happy you were the day that you got ordained? I've been to a lot of ordinations in my life, and it's just like when you go to a wedding, you, you know, you're supposed to look at the bride. You're not supposed to look at the bride when she's coming down the aisle. You look at the groom. You know my favorite thing to look at on an ordination day is a mom's face. And in the moment that a priest hugs his mom after he's ordained, oh, it, like, it makes me tear up. Because th- that mom has given her son to us. Like, you're our dad now. So now a mother has a father that she gave birth to. It blows my mind. But do you talk about that? The, the priest that's probably closest to my family is a, a young priest named Father Trey Angie. We call him Patre instead of Pater. Um, and, and Father Trey baptized my daughter. Father Trey was my first small group leader when I was a freshman in high school and went on a thing called an agape retreat. And I remember him because he was a nut job. And he was just <laughs> filled with energy. And I was this introverted kid that didn't want to go on this retreat. My mom made me go on it. And now he's the priest that baptized my kid. 
And we have a picture of Father Trey on the wall because I'm all about sacramentals in the home because I think that's the way you propagate faith. As a kid needs to know that you're Catholic and see that you're Catholic. And so I've got this Come Holy Spirit banner in our formal sitting room and around it are all of our sacramental pictures. The picture of Tommy and I getting married, the picture of Rose being baptized, uh, a picture of us with Father Trey at Christmas last year. And Rose runs by it a dozen times a day. And she always goes, Patre, Patre, Patre. She sees him at church and she goes, Patre. She thinks other priests are Jesus, so we need to like work on making sure that like she understands the whole thing. But Patre, Patre, when Father Trey shaved his beard at Christmas last year, she cried when she saw him because she was so confused. Because it was his voice, and it, he smells very distinct. He wears a very distinct aftershave that like, kind of smells like old man vanilla, and it's great, and I love it. It's weird that I know how a priest smells, but it's a very distinct smell. And I know she knows the smell because she could smell him, and she could see him, and she could hear him, but his face looked different. And it just warmed my heart that my kid knew what a priest normally looked like because he's become such a part of our family. And, I, and the reason he's part of our family is because when Patre comes over, yeah, it's Father Trey. It's the man that says Mass. It's the man that preaches the homily. It's, it's the man that is in the person of Christ, but is also the friend that comes over and kicks his feet back and laughs and shares dinner with us and just hangs out. Last spring, my nanny called me frantically at 9.30, and she was stuck in traffic. She was supposed to be there by 10.00. And I had to get to the airport by 10.30 because we were boarding at 11 for my flight at 11.30. And her GPS was saying she wasn't going to arrive until 11.15. So I'm going to miss my flight if my nanny doesn't come. My mom was in meetings. Tommy's at school. My dad was out of town. My sister lives in Washington, D.C. I'm screwed. I call the neighbor. She's substituting teaching that day. The other neighbor, I don't know. They're not going to stay with my child. They're a complete stranger. For a half a second, I thought to myself, okay, Rose is down for her nap, but I can wake her up, and she's just going to come with me. The gig's going to surprise. I brought my infant with me. Like, you just have to host both of us. Like, that's the only solution I can come up with in my head. Tommy texts me, and he says, Trey's on his way. And I said, what? What? Like, not thinking. There's no way he called Father Trey. He said, Trey's on his way. And sure enough, 15 minutes later, Father Trey knocks on the door. And he said, hey, you got to go to the airport? I'm here. I said, Trey, you can't. You've got stuff to do. He's like, no, it's my morning off. I actually need to reply to some emails. This is a quiet place where nobody can find me. Rose is sleeping, <laughs> right? I said, yeah, Rose is sound asleep. Rose had no idea that the priest that baptized her babysat her for an hour and a half until the nanny could get there through traffic. And I always think back to that moment that he was just there. And I, I'm so close to him because of the stories he's told. I'm so close to him because of the time he's spent. I'm close to him because he's never popped out of the bushes and said, how you doing, and not listened to my answer. And so sure, the whole community is involved in the ministry of young people. And the whole community is invested in telling these stories. But guys, you're our dads. So that story and that witness, it starts with you. In the same way that it can fail with you. Jesus asks them, he listens, he tells a story, and then he sticks around for dinner and he's present to his people. He stays with them. And that's when they realize this incredible thing has happened and their hearts are burning within them and they are moved to then do what? To rush back and to share. They leave without delay and they rush back to tell people, we've seen him. He's back. He's here. We're not alone. He was right. Victory has been won. Right? And they return to encourage and to empower, to be present with them the same way Jesus was present with them. It's cyclical. Right? There's a model of ministry that it doesn't just stop, it ends. It's always a dot, dot, dot. It's always a continued story. Even when, ideally, we get to heaven. That's not when anything ends. The beautiful thing about Catholicism is that once you're alive, you're alive. And that new life that is found in Jesus Christ is life to be celebrated and life to, to be proclaimed and life to be encouraged. Francis says this, that in all of this that we're talking about, in all of this that we're encouraging, in all of this we're the community and we're the people that are called to do this, I'm going to put it all to the side right now and talk to the young people directly. Talk to the teenagers. Talk to the young adults. And tell them what's essential. And what's essential to them should be essential to us. What's essential for a young person to know means that we essentially have to proclaim it. To talk about at the root, what is the gospel? What is the kerygma? What is the thing that they need to know to engage and to keep them day by day, bit by bit, on this journey and not falling to the wayside, not becoming a number of disaffiliation, 
but becoming a disciple who is seen as one who loves Jesus. And what does Francis say are the most essential things? If we're looking at that road to Emmaus story and how Jesus propagated the faith, what are the most essential things for us to articulate to the young person? That God loves you. That Christ saves you. And that Christ is alive. That's it. There's your curriculum for the year. That's the message. There's a lifetime worth of homilies. And here's the thing. A teenager needs to know that and an 85-year-old. And the 50-year-old. And the dad who's lost his job. And the mom who feels like she's not contributing to the bottom line. And, and the teenager who's confused about what's coming up with college. And, and the, the single woman who wants to be married but, but nobody's asking her out. And the young man who's confused about what's coming next in his life, vocationally or personally. God loves you. Christ saves you. Christ is alive. And what does he say about these three things? He says to young people, for him you are worth it. You have worth. You're not insignificant. You're important for the work of his hands. That's why he's concerned about you and looks to you, we hear this word again, with affection. It's not that young people don't know that God exists. It's that they don't know that God loves them personally. It's not that they they disagree with whether or not there is an almighty being. It's that, does that almighty being care anything about me? Because a young person can look at a sunset and go, wow! Wow! And then they look in the mirror and they go, ooh. Not realizing that both are made in the image and likeness. We can keep going. That time and time again, he, talking about Christ, bears us on his shoulders. No one can strip us of the dignity bestowed upon us by the boundless and unfailing love. We hear it again. When we know we're loved, nothing can hold us back. When we know we're loved, nothing keeps us from the love of God. And neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principles, what holds us back if we know that we are loved? Alive, he can be present in your life at every moment to fill it with light and to take away all sorrow and solitude. That Christ is not a historical figure from of old, but is more alive than you and I. That the death of Christ led to victory in the resurrection leads to a life of resurrection. That Christianity is not pop psychology self-help, that is literally the life-changing experience. And that we are given new life. We're not just reanimated, we are reborn. That we're not just robots that articulate belief, but that we are disciples who give witness to love. Is that part of our messaging? Is that part of our witness? And I don't think it comes from a program. I don't think it comes from a microphone. I don't even think it necessarily comes through a good homily. I think it comes from relationships and community and love. My biggest frustration in Lake Charles recently has been our young adult ministry program is very formalized. It's come to this thing. Sign up for this Bible study. Join this small group. Attend this theology on tap. And those things are good. Unless you have a two-year-old who goes to bed at 7.30, and so to go to any of those things, I'd have to find a babysitter. It's good if you've got a normal traditional job, which I do not, which means I'm working five days, and then I'm home for six, and of course, during those six days, there's nothing while I'm home. So I was getting frustrated, and it was a personal frustration. It was a, why isn't this conforming to my desires? Like, I need to be youth ministered or young adult ministered to, or I need this as well, rather than recognizing the fruits that it was bearing. And so as I was getting more and more frustrated, I finally thought to myself, well, screw it. I'll just do something myself. We'll just have taco night. So I texted a bunch of my young adult friends and said, come on over for dinner. And we had taco night. And my house smelled delicious all day because I made the tacos in the crock pot so there wasn't a ton of cleanup afterwards. And our friends came over and they brought margaritas and chips and we made cheese dip and we just sat around for four hours. I have not had that many people in my house for a very long time. I was feeling every bit of 30 when they all left at 11 o'clock. But it was just community together. And in that community together, in the conversations and the laughter and the playing, one of them brought over the Nintendo Switch, which I didn't know was a thing. They were a little younger than me, so now I know that it's a thing. And, And we played video games and just like had time together in community. And in that time together, there was this this life, this joy, this recognition that our faith is very much a vibrant thing, lived in and outside the physical church building, in the life of people who love Jesus Christ. And so Francis then says this, we ultimately have to approach our young people with a grammar of love, not by being preached at. The language that young people understand is spoken by those who radiate life, by those who are there for them and with them, and those who, for all their limitations and weaknesses, try to live their faith with integrity. To know that we know we're not saints already. 
but that we are pilgrims on the journey too. And this is the final point that I want to make, which is more of a, an argument for a change in language. And I've made this argument in a few different dioceses, so hopefully it'll catch on eventually. That we change our mindset from ministers, because ministers do, right? I do ministry. I plan ministry events. I organize ministry programs. I am a youth minister who does something to propagate faith to youth and instead shift to an understanding and mindset of mentors, of companions, of people who walk beside rather than drag along. And that doesn't mean we change our titles. Like, you don't need to go back to Father and say, or Father, you don't need to go say, your new title is Youth Mentor, and I'm also cutting your pay, because according to diocesan policy, no, I'm not saying that. <laughs> Screw the policy, just like, this is internal heart understanding, right? <laughs> and in fact, mentors, I think, are much easier to tell the entire parish you are this. You are a person who is engaged in the propagation of the faith with young people because you are giving witness to someone in the way that you live, in the joy that you have, in the things that you say, in the relationships that you build. And so, from the document that we wrote in March of 2018, 300 other young adults who were told to be protagonists, 300 other young adults who were told to be present, and if we weren't present, something was missing, we said that the qualities of such a mentor of faith should look like, include, and this is where you take notes and pull your phone out. And this is where you start to ask yourself, am I embodying these qualities as a priest, as the paid youth minister, as a sister, as a teacher, as a campus minister, as a DRE, as a catechist, as a person in the pews who, I don't know why you showed up today, but you heard that we're going to talk about this stuff and you want to talk about it. Am I doing this? Being a faithful Christian who engages with the church and the world. And the world. Not a faithful Christian who locks the doors, shuts the lights off, and hides, but a faithful Christian who is in this world, knows things about this world. I shocked somebody the other day when I told them that my husband and I um, disagreed with the ending of Game of Thrones. They looked at me and they were like, you watch that? I mean, yeah, I'm one of those bad Christians that watched it. And we can have a debate about whether or not that was good or bad later. But I think I'm more shocked than that, like, I'm a, a Christian who watches television. Like, the fact that they didn't think that we did that really made me sad about the Christians that they've engaged with. But seeking a life that's not isolated, but is lived to the full in a world that needs to see life lived to the full. Someone who constantly seeks holiness, which is a veiled way of saying someone who prays, like, every day like a priority. And here's where we talk to the people who are paid to talk about Jesus and talk to the people where Jesus is your job. If you're not make of your 40 hours a week that you're being paid for, if an hour of that is not given to Jesus in prayer, whether it's in reading scripture or praying the rosary or going to spiritual direction or sitting in front of the Blessed Sacrament, if you can't give one hour to prayer of your 40 hours a week, quit your job now, please, and find somebody who is willing to do that. And I mean that sincerely. And fathers, if you have a youth minister who's not praying, call them on it. Tell them it's part of their job. And if they say, I don't know how to do it or I don't have time, then you need to have a face-to-face -face come to Jesus meeting with them. Because the constantly seeking holiness element is I can't talk about someone. I can't give witness to someone if I never talk to him. And if I never spend time with him. And if I never actually let him love me. And when Jesus is your job, it's very hard to get away from that being a priority. I've seen it all too often with priests. I've seen it with youth ministers. I've seen it in my own life. My good friend, Father Andrew Lynn from the Diocese of Milwaukee, frequently will text me and say, how's your prayer? Because he knows I need somebody to remind me that, you know what, today giving a talk for five hours, that was great, but that doesn't count as prayer time, Katie. That doesn't count. You still need to go back to that hotel room and pray that rosary before you go to sleep because that's the only way you're going to survive. You still need to make it a priority to get to a holy hour when you get home on Sunday because that's the only way you're going to survive. Constantly seeking holiness. Someone who's confident without judgment. And here's where sometimes we know we have the answers and our arrogance shines forth before our compassion. And I'll say it again, like I said this morning, they don't care how much you know until they know how much you care. And so you share the truth because you love the truth because you love the person you were sharing truth with. And so when they come to you with a question, and they come to you knowing you know an answer, are you confident in giving that answer without condemning them as you give? Someone who actively listens to the needs of young people and responds in kind. And it's very hard to think we know what they need, or very easy to think we know what they need, and much harder to ask them what they need. 
Maybe you've been doing Bible study as a parish community with 10 kids for 30 years, and you've never grown beyond 10 kids. So maybe it's not Bible study that they need. Maybe it's like playtime, fun. Maybe it's community. My second year as a youth minister, I had a young person come to me and say, I want to start going to daily mass, but I don't know how. And I thought it was the dumbest thing. I was like, what do you mean how do you go to, you just go. You just show up. Oh, you don't have to have like permission? No. It's, you just show up. It's just you go. Well, but everybody's really old there. Yeah, they'll probably be a little shocked, but yeah, you just go. He was like, well, can you come with me? And it was the sweetest moment. This little boy, Jacob Bear, going into his freshman year of high school. I want to go to daily mass, but I don't know how. So I said, sure, I'll come with you. And then I decided, because I'm a youth minister, and I'm always thinking about, okay, well, what could we turn this into? I'm going to go with Jacob, but I'm going to invite other people to come too. But here's the hook. How do you get teenagers to wake up at 6.30 morning for a 6.30 morning mass on Tuesdays and Fridays during summertime? So we added food to it, right? You all know where I'm going with this. I told them, if you come to mass at 6.30, Tuesdays and Fridays, afterwards we're going to go to the coffee shop up the street. I've got Father's credit card, and we'll buy coffee and donuts. <laughs> I told Monsignor after the fact. I asked for forgiveness after the first one that I did. <laughs> and he was all about it. Because I think he almost had a heart attack as he turned around after processing down the aisle and saw 40 kids sitting amongst three pews at 6.30 in the morning on a Tuesday with less than 24 hours of advertisement. I, I, I almost killed the guy because he, I mean, he was so shocked. <laughs> and that group grew and continued. And I'm not the youth minister there anymore. And it still is a, it's a thing that they still do going to the coffee shop, grabbing coffee, grabbing donuts, sitting around, talking, laughing. We didn't have a Bible, never brought a catechism, weren't wearing matching t-shirts. Like the only thing that identified us as Catholic was the fact that some of us had like Mary medals around our neck and rosaries hanging from our, our rear view mirrors. And we would sit and like the conversations that happened around those tables in CC's coffee shop were the best thing I've ever done or the best conversations I've ever had in ministry because we were together. And that was enough. We were together, and it was something that they needed. Permission to go to a parish and to go to a mass they didn't think they were allowed to go to because no one else there looked like them. So then they were paving the way for a practice of daily mass. I'm happy to report that that young man, Jacob Abair, who asked about going to daily mass on a regular basis, got not only very involved in our youth ministry program, came to NCYC twice, went to a Steubenville Youth Conference, was involved and engaged in all the things that we do, but entered the seminary this year and is at St. Ben's in Covington, Louisiana, pursuing the priesthood. And when I talk to him on a regular basis, because Jacob, he's one of my kids, he's one of my guys. When I talk to Jacob on a regular basis, he always goes back to that conversation where he was like, I was so dumb. <laughs> Like, how do I go to daily mass? He's like, yeah, no, the best part to that whole story, Jacob, is that you showed up in a suit because you thought you had to dress up for daily mass. And I love the fact that that, and he was a little boy. I mean, he was tiny, but he was a kid. He was 14 years old. That that engendered with him a love of the Eucharist, which when I read his personal statement, because he asked me to edit it for his seminary submission, then when he asked me to write one of his letters of recommendation, and then I got to do the interview with our vicar general, talking about him and his love of Jesus was all rooted in the Eucharist because of what we'd seen bear out in his life because we just started going to get coffee and donuts after daily mass. And I, if he, God willing, becomes a priest, I can't wait for him to come back and do one of the masses for Jesus in Java on Tuesdays and Fridays at 6.30 in the morning. Like what? You can take, it's not trademarks, just use the name, Jesus in Java. It's a great thing to do. Someone deeply loving and self-aware who recognizes his or her limits and knows the joys and sorrows of the spiritual journey. Right? Someone who recognizes they are a sinner on the journey rather than a saint that's self-ordained, self-canonized, whatever it is. That somebody who is actively participating in a life of faith and is encouraging others to come with them on that journey. And I'll start in the same way that I began with a story about a person who did that for me. I talked this morning about my second grade teacher, Ms. Tartamella, and a woman who prayed for her students by name, who was eminently aware of how to love the kids right in front of her, who was very present to me through much of my life and still is to this day. And I joked earlier, I had like a brief foray into atheism when I was a junior in high school, because Hurricane Rita hit Lake Charles in the fall of 2005, and 
After being evacuated for nine weeks, you all know what that is like. And the uncertainty and the fear and the confusion about what we were going home to. And even though my parents' house was fine, my mom's office had been somewhat damaged but was okay, my school had been destroyed. And so life was just disrupted for eight straight weeks. And I came back from that big evacuation pissed. We're adults here, I can say that. I was mad. I was angry. Like, deep in my soul. And who are you angry at when there's a hurricane? The weatherman? <laughs> Your mom? Certainly not my grandmother. Maybe my sister a little bit because we had to share a room for eight weeks and that was hell on earth. I never knew she snored until that moment. I was mad. And deep in my soul, I knew I was angry at God. Because bad things had happened to a very good town. A diocese of only 36 parishes. We are tiny. That's how many Catholic people are in Louisiana that we have seven dioceses. And ours is the smallest. Mad that he could destroy people's houses and knock down walls. Mad that he would let a Category 5 storm even exist in the world. Mad. Just angry. And we came back from Christmas break. So we came back to school and then we had Christmas break again. And we, we come back from Christmas break and I became the kid after we'd come back from the hurricane evacuation that asked a lot of questions of my theology teacher to try to prove that I was smarter than her and try to disprove God's existence. I was that kid. And thought that I knew everything and thought that I knew better than her. And, and she was a very peaceful, patient woman who, when we came back from the Christmas break, we walked into her class on the first day. And who should be sitting in the front of the classroom but Deacon Glenn Vite. And Deacon Glenn was our, um, he was our academic administrator at the school. And Deacon Glenn, he's, we call him Deacon Vite. I don't know why I'm calling him Deacon Glenn. Deacon Vite. He was like a cartoon of a man. And I say that lovingly, because I love the man very, very dearly. He kind of had a little bit of a hunchback. had a little bit of a lisp, and he kind of talked, you know, like a his very distinct voice. And he had a very thick New Orleans accent. So, like, he was just, a, just a, a, a distinct person. And he carried change in his pocket. And you could hear him jingling the change down the hallway of the school. So you could hear him coming from a mile away. And he would pop into teachers' classrooms all the time to observe. Like, just... You know, you all know these people that just, they're themselves, and they are very distinct. And we all loved him in the school. He was a good man. He was a, a prayerful man. He preached quite a lot at our school masses. Um, a lot of respect for the guy. But also, he was in charge of the classrooms. And so if the academic administrator is sitting in the theology classroom, again, the same way I was convinced I was in trouble when my bishop called me, I was convinced I'm in trouble because the deacon's in the classroom. And I sit down and... Ms. Delahousie proceeds to tell us that today is uh, Ask Deacon Bayou Anything Day. And we can ask him any question we want, and he's going to answer. And so my hand shot up in the air, and I was ready. How can a good God let bad things happen? How can, I mean, just grilled him, question after question after question. All these questions that I had that oftentimes I was not getting very good answers to. And he answered every single one. He was so good. He was a quick wit. I didn't know how smart he was. And like every question, I had another question to follow back. And he seemed to just be enjoying it. Like it looked like this was the best day of his academic career was debating me <laughs> in this classroom. At least that's what I had in my head. It was a very arrogant kid. The bell rings 70 minutes later. It felt like 10 minutes. Like it was just an incredible class period. I am just amped. And he comes up to me afterwards. And he puts his hand on my shoulder. And he kind of squeezes it. He went, come see me after school. And that's when I was like convinced I'm about to get kicked out of St. Louis Catholic High School because I just argued with this guy for 70 minutes. I show up to his classroom at 3 o'clock, or his, his office at 3 o'clock. And I kind of knock on the door and he looks up from his desk and he goes, oh, hey, you came. He's like, yeah, I mean, you told me to, you told me to come. <laughs> I wasn't going to not come. And uh, he said, great, um, do you want to get a cup of coffee before we get started? I'm like, what are we getting started? Like, what is it? <laughs> And so I said, yes, I'd never had coffee before. I acted like I did. And like I went back to the faculty lounge with him and had a cup of coffee and my life was changed forever. It was the first cup of coffee I'd ever had. And we, we go back to his office and we sit down and he went, okay, what else? What else you wanna ask? What else? And he just gave me permission to ask, to just ask questions. And we chatted and we talked and we laughed. And I just was so comfortable talking to this guy in his office. Five o'clock, two hours later, my mom comes into the office. And she's like, what is, is she in trouble? Like, she's like, she's convinced I've been held in there because I've done something wrong. And Deacon's like, no, 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 she just had a lot of questions. And I really wanted, she's, you know, she's a smart girl. You got a smart girl there, Marie. I really enjoyed talking to her. And he's like, hey, do you want to do this again next week? I was like, yeah, yeah, I do. He's like, great, I'll have some book recommendations for you next week. So sure enough, the following week, I came back to his office after school. A cup of coffee was waiting for me. 
I had not put like any cream or sugar in it the first week because I didn't know you could do that with coffee. So it was a black <laughs> cup of coffee. So I drank the sludge again. And he had a couple books waiting for me. Theology for Beginners by Frank Sheed. Prayer for Beginners by Peter Kreeft. A couple of Bible study recommendations that I could find online. And we chatted a couple hours. And we kept it up. And while all of this was going on my junior year, I was also, even though I profoundly declared to my parents that I was an atheist and did not believe in God, was still made to go to the confirmation classes because you know, they're good Catholic parents and you're still going to your confirmation classes. <laughs> and I decided about, you know, late March, early April, that, you know, this Jesus thing's not so bad, and if I'm going to be Christian, I might as well be Catholic. And you've got to have a confirmation sponsor, so I might as well ask this guy that's taken time to talk to me. So Deacon Valle was my sponsor. And I don't think I've ever seen somebody look as proud as he did when I asked him, would you be my sponsor? Just like the best smile. So he was my sponsor. And I, senior year, I was a student body president. And the student body president worked very closely um, with the academic administrator and the principal. So I still got to be around him quite a lot and just loved the guy. Went off to the University of Dallas and very similar to how Ms. Tartamelli kept in touch. I'd get emails every now and then from Deacon Valle or I'd come back into town and I'd make a point to go by school to say hello to him. Eventually he left the school and he was at a parish in town. And when I moved back to Lake Charles after college and after working in Chicago for a year, I needed the spiritual director. So Deacon Valle was the logical choice. And so we'd meet every six weeks, usually at the Froyo place because he loved Froyo. And we'd just chat about life and faith and Jesus. And it was, it was exactly what spiritual direction should be, which is when you're carrying a sack of grain on your back and somebody's walking alongside of you and can notice when there's a hole in the sack of grain and point it out. Like, that's just, he was the perfect companion in my life. He read the gospel at my wedding. Because why wouldn't he? Because he was a deacon and he could do that. <laughs> and also just somebody so important in my life. And so last December, December of, of 2018, um, I was sitting in the kitchen one morning with my daughter, Daniel Tiger was on in the background. Maybe that's why I hate the show so much. And my phone rang and it was the diocesan director of youth ministry for my diocese. And she said, Katie, um, have you heard? And I said, heard, heard what? And she said, Deacon Bayou passed away yesterday. And I said, what? He was headed to Houston for a routine procedure with his colon. And she said, yeah, it was routine. And um, he just, he coded on the table and he didn't wake up. His wife had not even gone with him to Houston, because that's how routine this was. And he just died. And she said, I, just, I wanted you to hear it from me before you saw it online or before you, know, you saw the memo from the diocese. And I hung the phone up, and I'm sitting there, and Daniel Tiger's playing in the background, and my daughter has no idea what's going on. And I just start weeping as I realize like, this guy that had just always been there was now just not there. He was just gone. His funeral was the following week. Our cathedral was about to undergo a massive renovation, restoration, and they kept it open an extra week before they shut it all down for the construction crews because we needed the biggest church in our diocese. The wake was supposed to start at six, the rosary and such. So I told Tommy, we're getting there at four because I want to get a seat two hours. That should be plenty of time. And we showed up and there was already a line down the aisle, out the door and wrapped around the cathedral twice of students and of people that had just known the man for years. And I thought I was special. I thought I was one of the only people he'd ever done that for. But nope, that was his MO. A man eminently present to the people he was with. And as I was reading Christus Vivit when it came out just a few months later, just wanting to call him to talk to him about it. These lines Mentors should not lead young people as passive followers, but walk alongside them, allowing them to be active participants in the journey. They should respect the freedom that comes with a young person's process of discernment and equip them with the tools to do so well. A mentor should believe wholeheartedly in a young person's ability to participate in the life of the church. A mentor should be there to nurture the seeds of faith in young people without expecting to immediately see the fruits of the work of the Holy Spirit. This was the guy that did that for me. And so I think as we do this job, and as we work with these young people, so often we look for immediate fruit. We look for instant proof that our program worked, or that our homily packed a punch, or that the workshop we delivered in, impressed, or, or we, we hope that what we've done was worthwhile and was fruitful in their life, forgetting that most of our companionship and our accompaniment and our journeying alongside of young people is casting seeds, hopefully on fertile ground. And as I was sitting 
in that church and then just a, a, a few weeks later on a plane barreling through the sky at 30,000 feet staring out the window. I just, I kept thinking to myself, I mean, memento mori, I just couldn't stop thinking about life and the transitory nature of it and how quickly it can happen. And, and then I started thinking about heaven because that's what we long for, right? And that's the question we're supposed to ask. How can I accompany my young people on the journey to heaven? And I started thinking about, well, what's heaven going to be like? Because I've always thought heaven sounds kind of boring. That we just have to sit there all the time and look at Jesus? I'm a youth minister. I don't do that. I do stuff. I plan. I talk. I can't just sit. Do you need me to order some pizza, Jesus? I can do that. And I'm, I'm pondering what heaven is going to be like. And obviously, if I think it's boring, then maybe I'm not ready for it yet. But I started thinking, like, maybe for those of us that work for the church, those of us that do, those of us that are with young people especially, Maybe heaven for us, because we can't sit still, is getting to stand by the gates. And every few people that come in, there's an angel there that goes, hey, you see him? He's here because of you. You see her? That's that girl that asked all those dumb questions in class that day. She's here because of you. Maybe that's what it's like, that we're planting seeds and we're not expecting to see it, and we don't demand to see it, but that we trust. That we are cogs in this giant wheel. And that that's okay. That as the wheel is turning, and as the seeds are being planted, as the faith is being propagated, we are a part of that larger story. Every summer when I do Steubenville conferences, I hear about Father Michael Scanlon, who's a Franciscan. And he's a Franciscan because there was a man named Francis, and there's a man named Francis because there's a guy named Jesus, and that we are part of the story. And if you're in the Diocese of St. Augustine, Florida, one of the oldest ones, right? The oldest? The oldest. I thought Baltimore was, no? The oldest parish. Sorry, I should have Googled that beforehand. I apologize. <laughs> we all have a Wikipedia article, I'm sorry. <laughs> that we're part of this larger movement and story and moment. And if you remember anything from Christus Vivit, it's not that there's methodology, and it's not that there's practicality, and it's not that there's an agenda that our Holy Father has given us, it's that he's asked us to be open to planting seeds and running the race and recognizing that sometimes they're going to run a little faster than us and hoping that they're patient and waiting for us when they get there. Amen? I'm pretty sure there's alcohol out there, which is good, because um, we're going to continue some of this conversation just together. And I would encourage, as we're drinking and we're enjoying this cocktail hour and just having this time together, um, that you maybe share with each other the people that have done this in your life, the, again, the mentors and the, the companions and the accompaniers. And then also maybe one practical thing that you can start to do in the life of your parish in the next week that can start to put some of these things into practice. So that's, that's your homework. The teacher in me can't not give homework. Thank you guys.